So Matthew chapter 28, I don't know the verse, but maybe some of you can be able to find it. In Matthew chapter 28, I, uh, the last two verses, I believe, the last two or three verses, what did God tell his Christians? That's how Christianity started. How Bible-believing Christianity started was through this command. He said, go ye into all the worlds and, pre and teach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So that's probably how the verse reads. But when G the Lord Jesus Christ gave that command, He gave it to 11 apostles and only a few hundred Christians, perhaps, that time. So Christianity was a minority. It was started by, think about this, a Jew, a carpenter's son. Yet how did such a movement become so powerful and lead us to today, surviving for thousands of years? Our Bible-believing history is very, very rich. How we start our Christianity, the first word where Christian came from was from Antioch. Antioch. The Bible says at the book of Acts, it was at Antioch where they were first called Christians. And that's how Christianity started out. In Acts chapter 2, there was a great revival where the Apostle Peter preached and churches were planning and then it was spreading. God's movement was spreading. And the name Christian came out later on at the city of Antioch. This was the heart of of Bible-believing Christian, Christianity, Antioch. It was at Antioch where we received the copies of the manuscripts of our King James Bible, the Byzantine manuscripts around Antioch, Syrian area. The Christians were heavily persecuted and tortured during this time period. Satan wanted to wipe Christianity off the map. So in order to do that, why not use bloody persecution and wipe them off the face of the earth? In fact, so much blood was poured out, so many Christians were tortured and persecuted, that the lions, they were sick and tired of eating more Christians because their bellies were full of so many dead bodies of Christians. Governors who were all bloodthirsty and enjoyed the, enter the entertainment of Christians getting slaughtered at the Colosseums were now so sick and tired with the slaughter, conscience was bothering them, and they even begged some of the Caesars to stop the persecution of the Christians. That's how much blood was poured. You know why? Because you believe in an adversary, right? And when you believe in an adversary, you will realize also how important our history is. And our adversary, he wanted to wipe them off the face of the earth. Blood was spilled. Diocletian, his persecution was infamously known for thousands and thousands of Christians. In fact, he killed so many thousands of Christians, Diocletian was one time cried out, the name of Christian is extinguished. But you know what? Christianity increased even more. Right. Women and little children would hold hands and surround each other. And they would sing hymns as the lions came out of their dens and tore them to pieces. Old men were being crucified on crosses and they appreciated dying like the Lord Jesus Christ. The soldiers in mockery of some of the Christians thrust a spear on their side, decorated a crown of thorns on their heads, crucified them on crosses. But you know what? Some of the Christians took that as a privilege to die just like how the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior, died. I mean, it was unthinkable. Christianity was getting so powerful and the devil couldn't stop it. The 12 apostles during this time period, or the 11 apostles more exactly, but Matthias who joined the 12, most of these apostles were actually martyred. That's how they ended their lives. Most of them died being martyred for the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of them, if you read their story, some of them died actually street preaching against some of the pagan festivals and some of the sins that the people were committing. That's how they died for Jesus Christ. You see how Bible believers were like back then? Yep. What happened to today? What happened to today? You need a rich church and nice building, rich cushions. You need to have social programs and a lot of people. That's not how Bible-believing Christianity Amen. was built back then. Polycarp, one of the early Christian leaders of that time period, who, he was discipled under the Apostle John that time. Polycarp, in his 80s, he was tied to a stake, and he was going to be burnt alive for Jesus Christ. When he was told to recant, Polycarp cried out, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king, king who has saved me? 
And so, you know what? They got angry and they burned him at the stake. But you know what? He was still alive. So one got so angry that he thrust Polycarp with a spear. But when he thrust him with the spear, the blood poured out and doused the first fire. And he was still breathing. They got so mad that they had to light a second fire on top of that to finish the job. That's how he died for the Lord Jesus Christ. Ignatius was another early Christian leader. Leader During that time when he was arrested, Ignatius told the Christians, don't you dare come and rescue me. Don't you dare come and get me out of this prison. I want to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, when he came out of the de uh, when he came out of prison and the lions started to come out of their dens, Ignatius welcomed the lions with open arms and he told them to eat him because he was actually their bread, he said. Quote, I am the wheat of Christ. I am going to be ground with the teeth of wild beasts that I may be found pure bread. You know what the plain English of that is? If you don't understand archaic English, King James English, go ahead and eat me up. I'm your dinner. That's what he basically said. Tertullian, perhaps the best Bible-believing leader of that time period, Tertullian, he one time cried out. He one time wrote about this martyrdom of the Christians. He said this, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Basically, he was saying, you're just planting more and more fruit, more and more vegetables of us Bible-believing Christians. Let the blood spill. Let the blood pour. And you know what? Satan had enough of that. So he's like, okay, this is not doing the job. So what did he do? While you got one stream of Bible-believing Christianity going on, you got another stream going on down here. And he got the intellectuals, good old modern-day scholars today. Let's go to Greece, Plato and Aristotle. Philosophy. When you study philosophy, one of the earliest people that you will study are these two blokes, Aristotle and Plato. Plato and Aristotle opened up the philosophy where they start to critique Christianity, use reason above the Word of God. In fact, a lot of the, in fact, it is very possible that some of the famous philosophers during those days, and there were definitely many of the current students of that time who were trained under Plato and Aristotle, they were mocking the Apostle Paul when he preached at them at Mars Hill. And they mocked the Apostle Paul about his preaching of the resurrection. So the gospel was very cold in there. And Satan noticed that, see? And when he noticed that, he says, okay, then I'm going to use this bunch to affect the world so that they don't have to listen to Bible-believing Christianity. And then what was even worse is that it starts, so philosophy, the devil started to use that one. And then the devil started to use something else. He started to use Alexandria, Egypt. Alexandria, Egypt took the philosophies of the Grecians and it carried down all the way to Alexandria. Alexandria they became the enemy camp of this one. They became the enemy camp where they start to make their own manuscripts. Where the KJV was came, came from in Antioch, Alexandria, where it came from, was the good old modern versions. So let's put the NIV right here because that's the most idealistic one. So that's, there were your modern Bibles, Alexandria, Egypt. They start to correct the Word of God thinking what they thought was the right words. Why? Because they were very smart people. They were very smart people. Too smart for God, they thought. So Alexandria was one of them. But who was another one, you think? Good old Rome. Rome. Rome, during that time period, was another enemy camp of the early Christians. In fact, what is very interesting, when the Nestorians came out, that when the Syrian Christians came out, they were considered to be the oddballs. And official Christianity that time, which were called the Western churches, they were kicked out by Alexandria and Rome. They were kicked out by both Alexandria and Rome. Rome came to the scene. And when Rome came to the scene, you know how the Catholic Church was born? Through this man right here, Constantine. The devil used a brilliant plan because Christianity was so strong and growing and becoming more powerful. The devil realized, I'm going to take Christianity, mingle it up with paganism. Yeah. And Constantine combined the two together. Rome was dying. Christianity was growing. 
And Rome cannot die. Because Satan had to use Rome in the end times one day at Revelation 17. So what does Satan do? Rome will continue its power. Constantine was, was determined to continue the power of Rome by what? Mixing it up with Christianity. And that's what he did. And that's how Rome survived. It was through religion, not through its secular power. But you know what? Pretty soon religion became secular power itself. The church fathers and the early popes were the ones who contri contributed to the teachings of Roman Catholicism. And Roman Catholicism, its teachings, you must understand, did not come out immediately. It came out through a process of time. That's how heresy always works. That's how sin always works. Through a process of time, right? If you look at your own life, <laughs> that's how it always works. Process of time. Church fathers and early popes start to put out this Catholic doctrine and that Catholic doctrine. And then that's how Catholicism was born. Pope Sirius was the one who created the word Pope. Church Father Augustine said sprinkling baptism for babies was salvation. Church Father Augustine was also the one who applied all verses for Israel to the Roman Catholics as spiritual Israel. Hi, Stephen Anderson. Celestine I, he replaced the pagan goddess with the Virgin Mary. That's why they exalt the Virgin Mary so much. That's right. Why? Because it came from a pagan goddess. Yep. Well, strange why they would exalt her too much, huh? Church Father Jerome was the one who created the Catholic Latin Vulgate Bible. So now they, have, they also have another Bible coming out, the Latin Bible. The Latin Vulgate. And this Latin Vulgate became the one that became the enemy camp of this one. And through this line of manuscripts, through this stream of history, the devil start to use these people. And guess what? The devil accomplished this goal. Christianity disappeared. And now we came to known as the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages. This was a time of great darkness and great accomplishment from Satan. Satan won during this time period. Christianity faded and it fell away. Blind dependency on the church. Why? Due to illiteracy of the scriptures in what? Latin. It was all in Latin that time. So because it was in Latin of that time period, the Christians couldn't find truth. And that's why they were slaves to what? Whatever these guys said. These guys said why? Because these guys are smart. Listen to your modern scholars, the textual critics, Dan Wallace, James White. Listen to those guys. They know Greek and Hebrew. Listen to the Pope. Listen to those Jesuits. They've got many PhDs. What about your pastor? He doesn't have that many. Can he speak a couple different languages like my priest, like my Pope can? See, because of that, it became the Dark Ages because people cannot independently for themselves find the truth, but rather dependency on slaves to men. The popes were very corrupt. They slept with whores, bought the papal office with bribes, committed adultery on the supposed tombs of Peter and Paul, had dozens of illegitimate children running around the Vatican, lavished themselves with billions of dollars worth of gold that they went far beyond debt and bankruptcy. And guess what? They did all these sins in the name of Jesus. That's right. They did all these sins in the names of Jesus. Makes you proud of your old church back then, huh? During this time period, it was a great time of darkness, and Satan accomplished his goal. Why? It just takes a couple hundred years, process of time, just like our Christian life, and then he'll accomplish his goal. The Inquisition was another tool of Satan. The Inquisition, it was a... It was a horrendous, torturous period. Besides the death of our Lord Jesus, I can't think of any time period worse than the tortures of the Inquisition. I'd even probably say it was worse than the, than the Holocaust. In the Inquisition, they pulled you up to court without you even knowing why you were brought in, and they forced you through torture to confess to crimes you didn't even commit. The tortures, it was horrible. You just read Fox's Book of Martyrs. And I won't go through all the tortures, but just some. One torture device was the pulley, where they would tie your hands with thin pieces of rope. And because your hands were tied like this, and they would pull you up with those thin pieces of rope like this, they would put a, approximately 100 pounds on your feet. And with that, your arms are tended to 
break through this way. And many times their arms broke, and guess what they did? They reset the arms and did it all over again. They did it all over again. They would also use the rack. The rack, they would tie, tie thin pieces of rope on their hands and their legs, and they would stretch them. So that's what the rack was. And they would stretch them because those ropes were so thin. It is said that those ropes would tear through the skin, muscles, and even almost reach the bone. And Fox's Book of Martyrs record that the blood was squirted out to five to seven different directions. The worst part was the burning stake. Now, the burning stake is not a walk in the park, folks. You got to realize that you can literally burn for hours. Burning for hours. If you were lucky, if you were lucky to die at the stake, you would actually renounce your belief. And what those priests would do is they would tie gunpowder bags around the victim's neck and let the fire catch onto the gunpowder so, gun so that their heads can blow off. And that was merciful. That's the easiest way to die. Because they didn't want to burn for hours at the stake. It was horrible, the Inquisition. The total number of killed victims, you know how much they ranged? 50 to 100 million. 50 to 100 million people. That's how horrible the Inquisition was. So it was a time of great darkness. And that's when God started to revive Christianity. The Reformation came in. The Reformation came in. The Lord decided to make a combat. And these people start to come into the scene. As Bible-believing Christians, our history was about to die out. The Lord raised up a new brand of people. The Vadas during that time. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I'm not sure. But they were considered to be the old-time, old-time Waldensians. In fact, when the Catholics had their Bible, these people had our, their Bible. That's where the KJV traditional text came from. Amen. And that's where we call it the Old Latin. They had the Latin Vulgate, but these guys had the Old Latin. This is one of the greatest evidences supporting the ancient manuscripts of our King James Bible. This thing can go back as well from somewhere to be between 150 to 180 AD that time. So there is historical record that they had this kind of Bible during that time period, the Old Latin. So the Vaudois, these people were around Southern and Central Europe. So this is where the Lord used these guys, that Southern and Central Europe. These people People, during that time period, they would assign people in houses to memorize passages. And, you, and us church, shame on us, we only get one verse a week. And these people would memorize passages and chapters of the Bible when they meet together. In fact, when that's how the King James Bible was preserved. You know how the Lord preserved it? Not just through these people when they hide the manuscripts, tearing off pages and pictures, putting them in their coats, but they would memorize it. Wow. They would hide them in their heart. That's how it was preserved. That's how it was preserved. That's how the Lord used mightily these people. In fact, when one was about to be burned at the stake, he told those Catholics that, hey, you better buy more wood to burn than more of us Waldensians to burn because we're going to multiply. Why? Because he quoted, the word of God endureth forever. You know what he meant by that? The word of God in their minds, in their hearts. So he says, we're going to live and we're, it's going to be preserved. We're going to continue. So that's how the Lord mildly used them. They shook up the Catholic powers at Southern and Central Europe. But then God raised up another person, Savonarola. Savonarola. God raised him at the headquarters of the Italy, where the Roman Catholic Church was. Savonarola, during that time, he ministered in Italy. And when Savonarola was ministering in Italy... He was a preacher who was forbidden to continue under the ban of the Pope, but he didn't care and he kept preaching and ministering. In fact, he even held bonfires at his city to burn pornographic, pagan, and worldly objects. Boy, and then they'd call him a heretic. People today will call that extremism, right? right. Man, look at these. Look at that. What happened to us, man? Look at these guys, man. Christians back then. Christians back then. When he was offered a red Catholic cardinal's hat, he instead replied, I'll take a red hat of blood for Jesus Christ instead. <laughs> and that's what he got. Yep. That's what he got. He was burnt at the stake. And the priest said, said to him, 
So I'm just going to ad lib it, all right? I'm going to ad lib it. But the priest told him when they, he was about to be burnt at the stake, I separate thee from the church of Rome. I separate thee from the church of God. But Savonarola, he said this, you can separate me from the church down here, but you can't separate me from the church up there. That's, right. <laughs> That's what he said. So he said, so basically the, the quote went like this, the church militant, yes, but the church triumphant, no. What he meant was this, this earthly church, yes, but not the church up there, up in glory. Boy, the devil was mad, and then, but God raised up more Christians. Wycliffe was the next one. He was known as the morning star of the Reformation. He was a brilliant man. He ministered in England. Now God was using them in England now, not just Italy, southern central Europe, but now England. He was the scholar of Oxford, and you know how he wrote the entire English Bible? By hand. By hand. They didn't have printing presses back then. He wrote the whole English Bible by hand. His followers were so poor, and they were poor, ragged street preachers. Uh, kind of familiar? Kind of familiar? Yeah. Look at us today. And you know what they were called? They were called Lollards that time. They were called Lollards. When Wycliffe was a, uh, fell ill near death, the Catholic friars, they hurried to his bedside, hoping that he would repent. But you know what Wycliffe instead said? He instead preached at them, I shall not, I'm saying quote for quote, I shall not die, but live, and again declare the evil deeds of the friars. And you know what? God spared his life, and he kept kicking them ever wow. since. <laughs> for a sick man, he, he had a lot of life in him. And then God raised up another man, John Huss. Now the Lord was going to use him around Czechoslovakia, on Bohemia at that time. It was called Bohemia of that time period. John Huss, he was influenced by John Wycliffe's writings. He was known as the scholar of Prague. And because that man, he was preaching to the people in the common tongue of that day, which was forbidden because you had to do Latin. Why? That's where your Bible came from, the Catholic Church says. The Latin Vulgate. But John Huss, he preached to them in the common tongue. And because of that, they tied him to the stake and they condemned him to be burnt at the stake. But when he was tied to the burning stake, he instead rejoiced, quote, My Lord Jesus Christ was bound with a harder chain than this for my sake. Why then should, by, should I be ashamed of this rusty one? <laughs> when the priest opened up his arms, and the priest said, We commit thy soul to the devil. John Huss, he cried out, But I commit my soul into thy hands, O Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he died being burnt alive at the stake. He died singing hymns. That sounds like a Bible believer, right? That sounds like old Christian. What happened to Christianity today? Shame, shame, shame on you, man. Shame on you. The same day that John Huss was burnt alive, you know what they did? The same day he was burnt alive, they dug up John Wycliffe's dead body out of the grave, and they brought it to court, and they condemned it. I mean, he was already dead. But they dug up the dead body of Wycliffe, put it on, tr found it guilty on trial, and then burnt his dead body and threw the ashes on the Elbe River. Because the Catholics wanted to make an example. They were sick and tired of these guys. And they said this, oh, Look, it doesn't matter if you're alive like us and you're dead. The same day that you're alive, we're going to burn you up, John Huss. And he, the same day he was burnt alive was the same day that they found it, his dead body guilty in trial and t got rid of the ashes. So they said, doesn't matter if you're alive or dead, we're still in charge. You, we're still in charge. Don't mess with us. But Huss, he gave a prediction. He cried out to them, one day... Uh, you, you are now going to burn a goose. That means him, Huss. But in a century, you will have a swan which you can neither roast nor boil. And God blessed that prediction. And we'll see who that swan is later on. But then the Lord was setting things up. God used another person, Erasmus. Erasmus was a genius. If you want to know one of the most genius manuscript scholars, even the textual critics will not deny it. They'll have to admit Erasmus as one of the top. The one of the top three. Erasmus is one of the most brilliant men of that time. He was praised by kings all over. In fact, even King Henry VIII, one of the worst kings, praised Erasmus. Erasmus, because he had to translate the Bible, and wh which our King James Bible came from, where are you going to get the manuscripts? Where are you going to get the books? 
the Catholic Church had it all. So he had to go with the Catholic Church to do that. But you know what? He was not a really good Catholic because he was writing tracts critiquing some of the popes and the Catholic Church. And that's where the Textus Receptus manuscripts came from. From the Waldensian's Old Latin Bible, as well as a combination. And guess what? The Lord you mightily used Erasmus of that time period, where the King James Bible started to spread. From Erasmus, that's where you got, in, where it eventually spread into Luther's German, Diodati's Italian, Olivetan's French, Valera Spanish, Tyndale's English, and all the right Bible languages today. Because it came, the Textus Receptus Greek manuscripts came from Erasmus of that time. And that's how the Lord mightily used him of that time period. So while he was acting like a good Catholic by day, not saying anything bad, by night he was writing tracts critiquing the Catholic Church system. Then the Lord raised up the swan. And Erasmus was contemporary with this swan at that time period. Martin Luther. Martin Luther was that swan. They burned the goose. But the Lord was going to raise up a swan. Martin Luther, during that time, now the Lord was going to minister to Germany. Germany was now the intention of that time period. In Germany, Martin Luther was a dedicated Catholic monk. And he earned his doctorate as well and became a priest. But Martin Luther, when he went, to the, when he went on a pilgrimage to Rome, Luther, out of adoration to Rome, bowed on his knees and he said, Rome, holy Rome, I salute thee. But then when he went inside the city of Rome, he was shocked to see so much fornication, drinking, gambling, uh, irreverence in the church, in the city. That You know what Martin Luther said one time out of disgust? He said this, this is not some Bible-believing preacher today, okay? I'm talking about 1,500s people, all right? You know what Luther said? If there is a hell, Rome is built upon it. Amen. <laughs> that's what he said. If there is a hell, Rome is built upon it. And during that time, that's how the Lord used him. He read Romans chapter 1, the just shall live by faith. He realized it's by faith alone, not by salvation, by works. And that's how he got saved. And what he did was he posted 90-something arguments in his long thesis. And then he started, and you know what he did? He stamped it in front of the Catholic Church door. And so many people saw it that they were spreading it like wildfire. During that time period, the Pope, you know how the largest Catholic Church was built, St. Peter's Cathedral? You know how that church was built? By Pope Leo. Pope Leo, he needed money. He was getting bankrupt. Excuse me. He was, getting, he was losing money, bankrupt, and he needed more money. So you know what that godforsaken devil did? What he did was this. We're going to make a big sale of indulgences. So basically, if you buy this piece of paper called an indulgence, you're going to get full forgiveness of sins. And not only that, one of your loved ones who's burning in purgatory, that person's soul will go up immediately to heaven if you buy this indulgence. Boy, people were... You betcha so many poor damn souls bought it because they were in the dark ages. They didn't know. Luther, he got mad. So he posted 90-something arguments in front of that Catholic church door and that started to spread like wildfire. And when that started to spread like wildfire, I mean, it started to reach the ears of the big shot through the Vatican and eventually the Pope. The ears of the Pope heard it. And when they read one of, those, one of those statements on the paper, oh, it's just gold, I like it. Luther said this, if the Pope really has pure Christian charity and he has the power of God's forgiveness, why does he not empty up all of purgatory right now? <laughs> Boy, he got mad. And the Pope, he said, what drunken German wrote those words? And they said it was Martin Luther. And the Pope, he said, we're going to make a ban on Martin Luther. We're going we're gonna to execute communicate him. You've got 60 days to retract your writing. But I guess the mail came in late. And when Luther got the mail, he said, when do I retract my writing? They said, tomorrow. So you know what Luther did? He held a big bonfire at Wittenberg, Germany. And he took that papal bull that gave him his excommunication. And he told in front of all Wittenberg, Rome, because you destroyed the works of God, let God destroy you in these flames. And he tore that papal bull in half, threw it in the fire, and all of the uh, Christians in Wittenberg, they were like going, yeah! They threw all the Catholic objects, Catholic books, papal bulls into the fire. Boy, that did not help. That did not help the Pope after that. So now it finally reached the big shot ears of King Charles that time. King Charles, he was the most powerful emperor of that time period. 
the most powerful religious leader, the Pope, the most powerful secular leader, King Charles. And when Martin Luther was brought up in front of King Charles, he said this, that I cannot go against conscience. Now, this sounds like a Bible believer, right? I cannot go against conscience because it is bound to the text of the Bible. To go against conscience is neither right nor, nor safe. So I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand, so help me God. Amen. And that's what he did. And then, guess what? Now the secular leader, King Charles, had to kick him out too. So Luther was excommunicated everywhere. There was no way he was going to survive. But you know, the Lord preserved him. He had one of the dukes hiding Luther. And that's where Luther produced the Luther's German Bible for people to read today. That's how the Lord mightily used him. And you know what? The Catholic Empire started crumbling because one by one, more dukes start to listen. Princes and dukes and rulers start to listen to Luther. And King Charles' empire was crumbling because now it was Protestant powers and Catholic powers. And the Muslims were also invading the Catholic countries at that time. The Catholic Empire was losing its power. D-Day came. The Dark Ages was crumbling. God said, Catholic Church's power, your time is up now. And King Charles, he finally held a final meeting with all the dukes and rulers. And with those Protestant duke and rulers, he said, Unite with us. Don't let the empire crumble. Under the banner of Holy Mother Church, renounce these heresies. And you know what those dukes did? They even heard the rumors that they could be tortured by the Spanish Inquisition. And you know what? The worst branch of the Inquisition was the Spanish Inquisition. But you know what those rich, high and mighty elite dukes and rulers did? They start to bow on their knees and they said, if you, want, if you want to kill me, you can go ahead and chop off my head right here, right now. Yeah. And then one by one, the dukes start to do that. And the king can't do that because he needs those people to keep the empire going. <laughs> so he couldn't do that. And they said, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now made free Christian men, free now wow. and free forever. Amen. And they said, amen. amen. That's how we were free today, church. Bless God. God freed some of you from that devilish church, didn't He? Right. Thank God for that one. Amen. And the Lord, He freed us. He gave us freedom indeed. And the Catholic Church, that powerful empire, finally crumbled. Then there was the swan. But God was not done. God started to raise up more people. The devil was getting heyday. Another person was John Knox. Now he was going to shake up Scotland through John Knox. John Knox, he was considered to be the founder of the Presbyterian Church. His prayers were so powerful that it shook up the whole nation of Scotland. They imprisoned John Knox in the galleys for 19 months. If you want to know the worst kind of slavery and imprisonment of that time period, it was the galleys. And they imprisoned him over there for 19 months. But you know what? He still prayed. He still prayed and he still shook up Scotland. In fact, he put the fear of God all over Scotland that the Catholic Queen of Scotland, Mary Queen of Scots, she, said, she cried out, I fear John Knox's prayers more than all the assembled armies of Europe. That's how the Lord mightily used John Knox. But the Lord was not done. He started to raise up more people. And he raised up another person, William Tyndale. William Tyndale was another key player for the King James Bible today, you must understand. William Tyndale... He was one time at a table eating with a few Catholic scholars and they were talking about the Pope. And William Tyndale, he told those Catholic scholars, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life, <laughs> ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to, more, to know more of the scriptures than the Pope does. <laughs> They got mad. They got mad and went off in a rage after that. Boy, his life was marked. You know what, what time period Tyndale was in? Which, which king of England that time? One of the worst kings of England, King Henry VIII. This guy had no chance to give us the Bible today. He was getting chased all over by King Henry VIII and the Catholic Church Empire. There was no safety for Tyndale. But you know what? William Tyndale, he kept translating the Bible. He kept translating the Bible to English. And guess what? The Catholics caught him. They finally caught him and tied him to the stake. And guess what? He didn't finish the English Bible yet. So guess what? We're going to lose the Bible. It's too late now. But William Tyndale, he was tied up to the stake and he gave one last cry to God. He cried out, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. 
There's no way that's going to happen. King Henry VIII, no way, no way in the world. But you know what? After he was burnt alive at the stake, King Henry VIII took Tyndale's Bible and had some of his scholars look through it, and they can't find genuine flaws with it. And King Henry VIII, you know what that, that messed up man, that wicked king said? The Lord, that's how God uses wicked men, man. He can use anybody. King Henry VIII said, If there be no heresies in this book, let this book be spread abroad through all the people. Yeah. Finally, people had access to the Bible. They couldn't for, for centuries until a wicked king named King Henry VIII gave them freedom. And guess what? He, he was so arrogant and wicked that he broke off from the Catholic Church. And because of that, England, God turned his attention to England. And that's how Bible-believing Christianity was grown and preserved and raised. It was because of England. And how did God use it? A wicked king named King Henry VIII. Isn't your God amazing, folks? Amen. Man, and so the Catholics, they lost England. And the English Bible spread that time. Before we go back to England, this is an important group of people that you need to know. And that's where our Baptist heritage came from. Not officially, but these people were one of the root causes. These were called Anabaptists. Why were they called Anabaptists? In fact, these people were considered to be really radicals and extremists compared to the official Christians, these guys. Even these guys thought that these guys were extremists. Why? Because these people went so much by the Bible. And some of these people, even though they were saved Christians and God used them, they still held on to some Catholic influence. But these Anabaptists start to dismiss more and more Catholic teaching. They start to look radical and extremist. Sounds familiar? Yeah. Small fringe of weird radicals yeah. who breaks off from the official godly Christians. I mean, who, 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 I wonder. Bible believers, welcome to the fold. Welcome yeah. to the fold. When you touch that book, man, it's going to do something to you. That's right. It's going to do something to you. And these Anabaptists, they were known for knowing so much Bible, knowing so much Bible. They were like Bible believers today who debated successfully. And then both Catholics and Protestants couldn't crush these Anabaptists. And both groups actually persecuted the Anabaptists. But they couldn't crush them with Bible because they knew too much. They knew too much of the book. They knew too much of the Word of God. In fact, one Anabaptist who debated so successfully in front of the Catholic Council... He had his tongue cut out. His flesh was torn seven times by iron tongs. And he was finally burnt alive. But before all that happened, you know what he told his Catholic persecutors? Those Catholic scholars who supposedly knew much of the Bible? He said this. This sounds like a Bible believer. Send for the most learned men. If they show us with Holy Scripture that we are in error and wrong, we will gladly retract and recant and will gladly suffer condemnation and the punishment for our offense. But if we cannot be proved in error, I hope to God that you will repent and let yourselves be taught. <laughs> that sounds like a Bible believer today, right? That, no wonder these guys were radicals, extremists that time. And that was how the Anabaptists were born. And let's come down to the key place. England. England. Remember England? Catholic Church lost its power when England came to the scene. And when England came to the scene, the Catholics realized, we need to get this country. We need to get it. Otherwise, Protestant Christianity is going to spread more. Edward VI took over after King Henry VIII died. And he was the one who favored the Protestants. He authorized 35 editions of the New Testament. But you know what? He died at 15 years of age. So then, a Catholic ruler had to take over. You know who that Catholic ruler was? <laughs> it was Bloody Mary. <laughs> Bloody Mary. So now we see chaos going on in England. You see how God and the devil are going through a showdown. So in this showdown of kings and queens in England, the Lord was trying to do something, and the devil didn't want it to happen. Bloody Mary took over after Edward VI died. She burned thousands of Protestants, and she married Philip II of Spain. Philip II of Spain, after Charles, he was even more powerful than Charles that time. You know why? Because his Spanish ships started to go through the New World and started conquering countries in the New World. So they were very powerful. Philip II of Spain of the, was the most powerful ruler of that time period. But you know what? God protected England. You know why? Because Philip and Bloody Mary, 
they could not produce children. Bloody Mary died childless. So the Lord protected the throne. So then guess who took over? Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth took over. And when she took over, she prospered England's Protestant empire. And because she pro prospered England's Protestant empire, the Catholic Jesuits, they tried to kill her several times. So then the Catholics, they said, we got to kill Queen Elizabeth. So then they went to Mary, Queen of Scots. Remember that queen, the one who feared John Knox's prayers? The, the Catholics decided to use her. The Jesuits started to use her to dethrone Elizabeth. But you know what? God preserved Elizabeth. She conquered Mary, Queen of Scots. And she... And Mary, Queen of Scots, was eventually executed by Elizabeth. So God preserved the throne. The kings, this was not working. So the Jesuits resorted to another tactic. Philip, take out your boasted Spanish armada that conquered the new world and take over England for us. England, guaranteed to lose. Guaranteed to lose. Their ships were poor compared to the Spanish armada. There was no way in all of history they were going to win. So you know, what, you know how God did it? God pr protected England. There was, and secular scholars still have to tell this story. There was a big wind that came over and somehow blew the Spanish Armada all the way up to Iceland. So then all, the, all that Spanish Armada, most of the ships went up to the coast of Iceland and they were stuck there. And the rest of the ships, they were conquered by the English ships. The Lord protected England that time. And you know what? Philip II of Spain lost his power because of that. The most humiliating defeat of all of history. Why? Because God came to the scene and protected England. And so because of that time, you can see a lot of action going on in England. You know why Satan was doing all this? You know why he was doing all this? 1611 was coming and King James came to the scene. And when King James came to the scene, the devil really did not want this to happen no matter what. And the Jesuits would not let it happen. King James, he hired scholars from Westminster, Cambridge, and Oxford to translate the King James Bible based off the manuscripts that the Lord used through Erasmus, the old time Waldensians and many believers who died protecting the book in your hand. Tyndale died burnt at the stake. Why? Because the Lord preserved it for something greater one day. For something greater one day. And what happened during that time period was that God used the best, most intellectual men to translate the English King James Bible. Westminster, Cambridge, and Oxford. And based off the manuscripts of this genius and the blood of the martyrs that time, the Lord couldn't pick a perfect combination for your King James Bible. The Jesuits were furious. So they had two who successfully infiltrated the committee. And you know what they did? They inserted the Catholic Ap Apocrypha. So they had two Jesuits infiltrate the committee, and that's why the old King James Bible, it would have the Apocrypha in it, because they infiltrated successfully. But you know what? The Lord protected his King James Bible. The KJV translators did not consider the Apocrypha as Scripture. So when you look at that old King James Bible, you're going to see the Old Testament and New Testament as part of the Bible. But in the Apocrypha, you're going to see every single page labeled Apocrypha, 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 Apocrypha. You know why? trying to show this is not part of the Bible. This is like an index, an in-between thing, an extra note. So the Lord, He protected it. So then what happened after that was that the Catholics, they start to come back. They, and you know what they did? They start to publish the Dewey Rames Bible. Do you know when this Dewey Rames Bible came out? This Catholic Bible came out? <laughs> it came out approximately two years before the King James Bible was published. See, the Catholics, the Jesuits were desperate. Satan had to destroy this because he knew something greater was going to come. And the, they, they, they started to destroy it, but that didn't work. So you know what they did? This one, this didn't work, this didn't work. The KJV translation, infiltration and attack didn't work. So they raised up another one. The gunpowder plot. The gunpowder plot. Some of you may have heard of Guy Fawkes. That's where the Jesuits start to use these people. Why? To attack King James and to prevent the translation of the King James Bible. Robert Catesby was one of the people who led the gunpowder plot. Robert Catesby Priest was a Jesuit leader, a Jesuit high-ranking leader. And Robert Catesby, Guy Fawkes, and those people, they start to plot 
against King James and hindered the translation of the King James Bible. How? How you do it is that you dig a hole underneath the parliament, put in gunpowder, blow up a parliament, and then you will hinder the translation going on. And they also try to plan to kidnap King James' daughters. But what happened? The Lord kept blocking it. When they were digging underground, guess what? They bumped into a wall. So they realized, man, we have to just go through the wall or something, but they couldn't do it. So you know what they did? They bought the whole building instead because the building's wall was blocking them from going through underneath the parliament. So they just bought the whole building. But you know what happened after that? Then parliament delayed the meeting a few times. So they had the gunpowder all set, the hole all dug up, but parliament, de uh, parliament delayed the meeting a few times, so the gunpowder was getting useless. So the Lord put another hindrance. Now, third hindrance. When they finally got the gunpowder ready, and they're going to blow up all of parliament, for some weird reason, the Lord led upon one of the soldiers or one of the people to go downstairs at four in the morning and to check things out. And he, and he found one of the people ready to light the gunpowder. And when the guy got caught, he was like, what's your name? And he's like, my name is John Johnson. Well, that was obviously a lie. So they said, who are the people? Who are, who are your uh, people who are uh, working together with you to conspire against the king? And so the plot went out. They went to that team, the team of people who are about to assassinate King James. And when they went to the people who are about to assassinate King James, here's another hindrance God put. Now they did their last stand. They took out their guns. They were going to shoot it out. They were going to shoot it out. But guess what happened? Their gunpowder was wet. So now the Lord was blocking and blocking and blocking them. And King James soldiers were just slaughtering them. And then Robert Catesby and the other people who conspired against King James, they were just getting killed and killed. So they said, we got to dry off the gunpowder. So they lighted a fire next to the gunpowder to dry it off. Well, that was a dumb thing to do. The fire obviously caught on the gunpowder and just blew up and they injured themselves. They got crushed. Robert Catesby, bleeding and dying, crawled to the image of the Virgin Mary, gave his last prayer and died at the feet of a pagan goddess, the statue of the Virgin Mary. These people were, there was definitely Catholic conspiracy involved in this. So the devil couldn't stop it. This didn't work, this didn't work, this didn't work, this didn't work. Sorry Satan, you lost. KJV 1611 was born. Amen. And when this was born, people start to say, Thus saith the Lord. Let's continue our history next service. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the teaching of thy word. I pray this was a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, five minute break, everybody. <laughs> five minute break. brother. Yeah. Don't pick the NIV now. <laughs> I'm going to weep over these Milanos right here. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let me drink some water and then uh, we'll get started. Where did I put my water? Oh, there it is. Okay. Ah, ah, ah. Okay. <clears throat> The King James Bible was born, and because of this, the Dark Ages and the Catholic power lost it, and the Great Awakenings came. That's when the Lord mightily came in, the Great Awakenings. During the Great Awakenings, revival, to spread, revival spread like wildfire. Because of the birth of the King James Bible, now you got men who had the perfect words of God, who can preach the perfect words of God, build their faith on the perfect words of God, and start to plan missions. It was after this that you got the greatest revival in New Testament history next to the Apostles, and it was a Great Awakening revivals. The Great Awakening came to the scene. Catholic power crumbled forever. Dark Ages split faded away, and all the pagan religions started to tremble when the Great Awakening started to rise up in might and in power. John Bunyan was one of them in the Great Awakening revivals.
he was known to street preach without a license. And because of that, the English court always brought him and arrested him. But John Bunyan, he told the council, you arrest me today, I will preach tomorrow. One time they arrested him for a long period of time that his daughter wept in front of Bunyan and his daughter cried to Bunyan, please, please take back what you said. But you know what Bunyan said? He said, I will never recant even if the moss grows over my eyebrows. And man, that man was strong in the Lord. It was very difficult seeing your own daughter weeping. But you know what Bunyan and stood strong for the Lord. God used another person named Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, he was known to have a squeaky voice. So he's a born preacher, you must understand. Some, he would read notes when he preaches. You talk about dull. You talk about no great awakening. But you know what? God uses anybody for His glory. Amen. You don't have to be skilled or talented in voice. God will use anyone. And how God used Jonathan Edwards is his famous sermon that became a historical time. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. You will get saved again after reading that sermon. Boy, when Jonathan Edwards started to read that sermon, people were slipping on their, pew, on their pews as if they were dropping into hell. They started crying and weeping, and they held an all-night prayer meeting after that. That's how the Lord mildly used Jonathan Edwards. Oh, I, my ministry is not about hell. What happened to you, man? What happened to Christianity back then? Man, they held an all-night prayer meeting. Why? Not a sermon on heaven, but on hell. Maybe we should do one on that one day. <laughs> Lord also used John Wesley. John Wesley, he was the one who founded the Met Methodist. Wesley, one time, he was halted by a robber. And the robber made Wesley toss over his money. And when Wesley tossed over his money to the robber, Wesley told that robber, the time will come when you will regret your ways. And when that time comes, remember this. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sins. Approximately 20 years later, a well-dressed gentleman came to him and he said, Do you remember, Pastor Wesley, about the robber that you told the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sins? And Wesley said, Yes. Well, the robber said, Well, my time came that I did regret my ways, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleansed me of all my sins. Amen. That's how he got saved. George Whitfield that time. The Lord mightily used George Whitfield you talk about street preaching, man. He'll put us to shame. His voice can boom over a mile long. We should work on our voices, man. His voice boomed over a mile long. He didn't need any mics, folks. He didn't need any mic. He preached uh, nearly an hour sermon just like that. Long sermons like that. In fact, the deist Benjamin Franklin couldn't stand it that when he went away from Whitfield and he was in town, he still heard Whitfield's preach and booming in his ears as he closed his hands on his ears. But Benjamin Franklin was very curious and attended one of Whitfield's sermon in person finally. And you know what the Holy Spirit did? He, he started to prick Benjamin Franklin's heart. And when the, when the offering was being passed out, that rich deist who, didn't have, who is supposed to be rich and have all the money, who didn't intend to give one dime to George Whitfield, got under conviction. And Benjamin Franklin had to ask the guy next to him, Hey, can you give me money so I can put it at the offering plate too? But that's how the Lord mightily used these men. Great awakening revivals. Billy Bray, you think that shouting, running the aisles, is something crazy and that people back in the old days didn't do? You were wrong, friend. Billy Bray, during those old years, during the 1600s, 1700s, he was one of those old-time Methodists who would shout, run around the aisles. That guy, if he saw somebody in church who he felt like was not right with God, he would pick up that person, run around the room with that person and say, Glory! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! When he died, he shouted glory when he died. The doctor was under conviction. Billy Bray, as he was dying, he told the doctor, glory be to God, I shall soon be with Jesus. Shall I tell him, doctor, that you will be coming too? <laughs> and that doctor who wasn't a Christian got under conviction. And Billy Bray, as he was dying, he said this, glory be to God as my soul goes down to hell. I'll still shout glory, glory to God all the way. That Satan, he'll hate it. And he will say, Billy, this is no place for thee. Get thee back up. And up to heaven I will go shouting glory, glory to God all the way. Guess what his last word was before he died? Glory! So that's how he died for the Lord Jesus Christ. Another person God used was David Brainerd. David Brainerd that time, 
he surrendered to God at the mission field early 20s early 20s he studied in Yale but you know what he gave that up to serve God to minister to native pagan Indians in the mission field of America one time he prayed so hard in fact his prayer life was known to be so powerful sometimes it's recorded that he would melt the snow around him when he would pray one time he prayed up so much and he had a burden with these Native Americans who held up an idol idolatrous feast. And Brainerd was so burdened that he prayed for them all night. And when he came out, those Native Americans stopped. And then the Holy Spirit starts to convict them all of a sudden because they start to see a glow out of David Brainerd after he came out of prayer. The idol he stopped the idolatrous feast through prayer. That's how the Lord mightily used David Brainerd during that time period. He also used other people. Charles Finney. Charles Finney. This guy was known to be a big soul winner. A man who used to be one of the Masons now left it and became a Christian. He started to win souls left and right. He started to, he started to just lead people to Christ. He was a soul winner. One time he went inside a factory and in this factory everybody was working. But then Finney was talking to one worker, then another worker in the factory, then another worker in the factory. That everybody's, that the person, of the, the person in charge of the factory had to close it for one day so that everyone can listen to Finney preach. And Finney let that whole factory to salvation to the Lord Jesus Christ. You talk about Great Awakening Revival. Peter Cartwright. Oh boy, he was a rough preacher, this guy. Peter Cartwright. They'd lock him up in jail today if they saw him alive. Peter Cartwright, this guy. <laughs> one time he went inside <laughs> one time he went inside <clears throat> this liquor store and he went to one of the merchants <laughs> And, and that merchant started to talk trash against Peter Cartwright. And Peter Cartwright took that merchant by the neck and he started to beat him in the face. And he started to sing, All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate. He was singing a hymn when he was beating him up. So the liquor merchant let him go. He said, Okay, okay, okay. And Peter Cartwright was able to continue on his ministry. One time he was at a dance hall. that, uh, And he went inside this dance hall. And what was so funny is that one of the uh, ladies took his hand to dance with him. And then Peter Cartwright said, let's all have a word of prayer. And he went on his knees like that. And that girl was under conviction. And she started to pull away. But Peter Cartwright kept grabbing her hand. And he said, Lord, I want to thank you. And he started praying. Everybody was under conviction. People started to leave the room out of shame and humiliation. And guess what happened? He turned that dance hall where people were drinking as well. He turned that whole place into a church service. And he built, he changed that place into a church. And he said, I'm going to send one of my pastors here to start a church over here. So they transformed that into a church instead. The Lord mightily used Peter Cartwright back then. Another person that the Lord used was William Carey. William Carey. You notice how many, how different these characters are, right? God used a rough person, Cartwright. God used a soul winner, Finney. God used a young adult. God used a crazy guy named Billy Bray. And God used a holy man like Wesley. God used a person with a loud mouth, Whitfield. You see all these different characters God is using? That's right. You see how God is using that? That's a mighty God you've got. He'll use anybody for His glory, man. Another person God used was William Carey. This man was a very soft heart. If it wasn't for this man, we would not have missionaries today. I probably would not have heard the gospel if it weren't for this man. William Carey, this man, he was known as the father of missions. And he had a burden for souls. But the Christians, they were sitting comfortably in their seats. And they said, no, God will send them the gospel in his time. But Carey said, no way. I'm going to give the gospel. And he went to India, Hindu India, where they would burn up widows next to their dead husbands. And Carey was so burdened. But he would preach to those Hindus and witness to them, lead them to Jesus Christ. In fact, that, that poor man, one time he was teaching a geography class. And when he was teaching geography class, going to this nation and that nation, when he would point his ruler at one nation, tears would well up his eyes and he'd cry. And he'd tell the students, in that nation, there are people over there who never even heard the name of Jesus. 
That's why he became a missionary. That's why maybe we should all take geography class and have a burden for souls after that. But then the Lord started to raise up more people. He raised up Adoniram Judson. This man, I admire him so much. This man could not win his first soul until probably after seven to nine years. This man suffered so much in the area of Burma. Burma was infested with Buddhism. Judson's life was pretty much a failure, it looked like. That man went in the mission field. No one listened to him. And he was persecuted and tortured and imprisoned at Burma. And while he was tortured in the prison, he would hide the Bible while translating the Burmese Bible for the Burmese people. But you know what? When he got out of prison, his heart was so much on that mission field, he kept ministering to those people. In fact, this guy would even lead some of the headhunters to salvation. And those headhunters actually became street preachers after that. One time, Judson was before a Burmese ruler. And Hudson had to, Judson, excuse me, had to ask this Burmese ruler for permission to minister in this location at Burma. But the ruler said no. And Judson said, why? You know what that ruler said? This guy's life is a flop, huh? The ruler told him this. My people, who are Buddhists, are not fools to listen to your religion. But I fear when they see the scars on your back, because he was tortured, they're going to listen to you. That's how the Lord mightily used him. And guess what he did? He ministered to the Burmese people. Another person God used was George Mueller. George Mueller. The man who's known to be a prayer warrior. You wanted your prayer answer, you'd go to this guy. This man was known as a prayer warrior. He would have testimony after testimony. When he died, he died praying over, over $10 million, but much more than that. Millions and millions of dollars during his days. Do you know how much money that is today, in today's standard now? Just by prayer, millions of dollars. One testimony goes where one time they had no bread and milk, but George Mueller depended upon God to bring in the bread and the milk. He prayed, Lord, give us bread and milk to eat. And then he had the children <clears throat> gather in the table. And he, said, and he had the plates and the forks and the knives, but the food was empty. But George Mueller said, I pray to the Lord and He will provide. One time, he got a knock on the door and it was a baker. And that baker said, I don't know what happened, Mr. Mueller, sir. But it seemed like God was dealing with my heart at 2 a.m. in the morning. And I just had a burden. So I cooked all this food. I baked all this bread for you and the children to eat. <laughs> Why? Because someone was praying at 2 a.m. That was George Mueller. And then there was a milkman that came by. And this milkman said... One of the wheels came off my wagon. So this milk is going to get spoiled. I don't want it to get spoiled. But it happened to get into an accident right in front of your orphanage. So I want to leave this milk to you. So they had food to eat and milk to drink. That's how God mightily used the prayers of George Mueller. This man was a prayer warrior. God answered his prayers mightily. Another person God used. You know how the Salvation Army was founded? Under this man, William Booth. How art the mighty fallen, right? Salvation Army, it's not Salvation Army today. But back then, it was Salvation Army. This man believed in salvation so much. Souls. In fact, one of his quotes is, Souls, souls, souls. That's it. That's one of his quotes. This man had a burden for lost souls. Sometimes his street preachers, some of his street preachers would wear raincoats or some kind of protective coats as a street preach. And people would throw rock, mud, and dead cats at them so that why? So that they can hinder the preaching of the gospel. But William Booth kept crying out, Oh God, what can I say? Soul, soul, souls, my heart hungers for souls. And you get scared during street preaching, huh? After that? You get scared in street preaching after that? William Booth, the Lord mightily used him. Another person God used was Robert Moffat. Robert Moffat. This man went into the heart of Africa and he wanted to win souls. While he was in one place in Africa, Robert Moffat, he wanted to win an infamous Africaneer chief to salvation. But this infamous Africaneer chief, he was known for killing people. He, they told horror stories about him. And then the white people, they told Robert Moffat, don't go and witness to that man. You're just wasting your time. He will, have your, he will hold your head on a basket. But Moffat went anyway. He said, I'm going to win him to Christ. And he went through the, the desert terrain, found that infamous Africaneer chief. And you know what? 
what he did? He opened the Bible, led him to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that African near chief, he cleaned himself off, cleaned up all that paganism and wickedness, came in all nice and clean, and they went back to town together. And then a bunch of, a lot of the English people, they were saying, who is that man? And Moffat said, that's the infamous African near chief. And they got all shocked. They said, no way. How did that happen? He got saved. That's what happened. And then, in fact, one of the one of the officials of that town, he had to say about this African ear chief, this is the eighth wonder of the world. You know why? Because God moved in. That's why there is an eighth wonder of the world. God mightily used these people. Another person God used was Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor. This man... Hudson Taylor, his ministry to the Chinese people, he had a burden for the Chinese people, ministered to them. In fact, after he died, when communism took over China, they had to disgrace Taylor's writings because they knew about Taylor's work. They knew his ministry, so they had to disgrace him when they took over. And when those communists took over, they took one of their authors and they said, <clears throat> you read all of Taylor's works and demonize him. You make him look evil. But when that communist author took Taylor's work and started to read his writings, the Holy Spirit burned on his heart. And that communist author stopped writing criticisms against Taylor, got on his knees and received Christ for salvation. That man got saved. See how God mightily used these people? He had missionaries. He had street preachers. He had people starting ministries. He had famous revivalists starting. And man, a heyday, a heyday. The devil couldn't take this. The devil couldn't take this. It was heyday, heyday all over. Lord raised up another person, D.L. Moody, D.L. Moody. So I'm going to squeeze in a couple more right here. D.L. Moody, he was a man who also had a burden for souls. He would go around telling people, are you a Christian, sir? Are you a Christian, sir? One time he went to one person and he said, are you a Christian, sir? But that man got so offended that he went to one of Moody's deacons and said, if I was a gentle, if I weren't gentleman enough, I'd, be, I'd have the right to punch him in the face for telling me that, for asking me that question. So then Moody was told by some of the Christians, oh, you have a lot of zeal, but not a lot of wisdom. Calm down. So Moody was sad. He was burdened. He went inside his room and started to pray for that man who he offended. But guess what? He got a knock on the door, and it was that same man he offended. And that man said, man, when you asked me that question, it started to bother me. I couldn't get off my mind. I want to be a saved Christian. And Moody led him to Christ right then and there. The man he offended, he led him to the Lord Jesus Christ. Moody was known to be a man who would get thousands on the altar, thousands of convictions, thousands of calls going on. James Chalmers was another one. James Chalmers, he was a missionary. You know where he was a missionary to? To the Cannibal Islands. In fact, he went inside one cannibal house where there was human skin and skulls all over decorating the house. And he would just sit down and witness to them right then and there. But James Chalmers, he had a burden for the cannibals. In fact, you know how he, how he died in the mission field? He died being eaten by cannibals. That's how much he loved the cannibal people. Man, what happened to Christians today? What happened to Christians today, man? This, the, this is Christianity right here, man. This is Christianity right here. James Chalmers, one time he was street preaching to those cannibals when they had one of those big feasts going on and he had two of his converts street preaching with them. So they were street preaching to a bunch of these cannibals. Chalmers, uh, they were street preaching nighttime for many hours and Chalmers said, I need to rest. So Chalmers slept and then when he woke up in the morning, he saw his two converts still street preaching. And he's like, have you had, have you been at it all night? I can't imagine that guy's voice is all sore. You know what he said? He said, Pastor, I went through the Garden of Eden, Noah's flood, the Mosaic Law, all the Old Testament. I'm about to start the story of Jesus, so I can't stop now. So he kept the street preaching that time. Man, during those old days, great awakening, great awakening, great awakening. Lord also used another man named Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday. You know why? You know why you got prohibition? You got that law passed out against alcohol? I'll tell you why. It's because of these guys, Billy Sunday. These guys closed the saloons. They closed the bars. 
Billy Sunday became the famous revivalist who is infamously known for closing the bars in the North. The North had its heyday. Northern America, their saloons were closing down. Why? Because of a cursed man that God used, Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday, he was a former baseball player star, and he also used to drink. He ran bases as a baseball player. But you know what? God used that talent of his in his preaching. So he would run the bases while he's preaching. He would even break chairs in his, while he's preaching and sometimes rip up his outer shirt. But that's how God used him. That's how God used these revivalists, these preachers, to bring people on the altar, to bring people under conviction. You see how God used so many different people for his glory? Look at that. Different people. Different people for his glory. He'd use the crazy. He used the rough. He used the tender-hearted. He used the soft-hearted. He used the intellectuals. He used the poor people, the smart people. God used everybody for his glory. This is the greatest awakening of all time. You can see. God mightily used him. Then God used another person to close the bars in the south. You got Sunday up in the north. Now you got someone on the south. That was Sam Jones. Sam Jones, a hopelessly lost drunk who was about to lose God. He got saved and he hated alcohol ever since. That man, Sam Jones, he closed the bars in the south. He was also responsible for the laws against alcohol. Excuse me. One time a liquor merchant got so mad at Sam Jones that he waved a $10 bill in front of Sam Jones. And he said this, I got it from some poor sap who bought my liquor. You know what Sam Jones did? He took that $10 bill away from that liquor merchant and he said, you know what, you're right, I'll have it. The devil had it long enough. That's what he said. <laughs> so the Lord used these people. These guys closed the bars. You know why? It took preachers, not scholars. It That's took right. preachers to do the Amen. job. God's men to do the job. What happened to the people? today today then God had to use another person at the south oh boy man oh boy Mordecai Ham Mordecai Ham came and that man he was listed as one of the four horsemen of revelation by the Catholic Church Catholic Church hated this guy that they dubbed him one of the four horsemen of revelation these revivalists crushed the Catholic Church system preached against the whore of revelation closed off sin and the bars and they brought revival preached on sin and hell salvation and the gospel Mordecai Ham, he, he wanted to convert atheists. He always wanted the toughest converts. And then, this is his tactic of so many. He went to a town and he said, who's the toughest atheist in this town? And they said, well, it's just one guy over here. And that atheist heard Mordecai Ham was about to visit him. So that atheist ran away. And then Mordecai Ham chased after that atheist into a barn. And the atheist was like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And Mordecai Ham said this, I'm going to ask God for two things. I'm going to pray for God for two things. I'm going to ask God to kill you or to save you. <laughs> That's what he said. The atheist had the fear of God on him that he got saved and he got his whole family saved and they all got baptized and attended church after that. <laughs> now, one time, these, these liquor dealers hated Mordecai Ham. So they all surrounded Mordecai Ham with clubs and knives and they were going to kill this guy. Mordecai Ham said his same old line, I'm going to pray for God to kill you or to save you. You know what happened after that? The guy who waved a knife at him, a windmill blew up, fell on top of him, killed the guy who was waving the knife at Mordecai Ham, injured half of the mob. What do you think the rest of the mob did? They got saved after that. <laughs> That's how the Lord mightily used these people that time. This guy was a rough guy, right? But you know how God used the roughness of some of these people for? You know who Mordecai Ham converted? Billy Graham. The famous Billy Graham today. You know how he got saved? Under Mordecai Ham's preaching. See how God uses anybody for his glory? You might say, well, I don't agree with this. I don't like what he did there. there. Hey, man, you weren't there. You don't know what God's plan is behind those scenes. And you should have read people in the Bible who did a lot worse than what these people did. You see how God uses people for his glory? He uses anybody. And I mean anybody Amen. for his glory. Praise the Lord. He uses any character for his glory. Now came the second horseman of revelation that the Catholic Church hated. 
So you betcha he's another rough guy. His name is J. Frank Norris. J. Frank Norris. Sometimes he'd go inside those Baptist conventions and they'd kick him out because he'd give them a hard time. J. Frank Norris, this guy, he was known to also be a rough preacher. And yes, because he's a rough preacher, you betcha he preached against liquor too. They hated this guy. You see what, you see what God was raising up, man? Real soldiers. Real men. Real soldiers. The Catholic Church had to list him as the other one of the four horsemen of Revelation. One of the lawyers who was, who, was, who was trying to sue J. Frank Norris and imprison him, you know what God did with that lawyer? That lawyer was drinking liquor. Uh huh. No wonder he wanted to go against J. Frank Norris. And you know what? He got into a vehicle accident. And his brains were dashed all over the pavement. You know what J. Frank Norris did? He took the broken bottle that the lawyer was drinking, scooped up the lawyer's brain, took it to his church service, and preached on Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death! Boy, those people got a heart attack. Some of them painted after that. But this guy got thousands. All these preachers had thousands. Thousands of people coming in. Thousands converted. Thousands changing their lives. That's how the Lord used them. Satan said after all this, I had enough. <laughs> I had enough. <laughs> I had enough of this. So the devil came in. And you know what the devil did? That old devil did? He raised up something to conquer against the Great Awakenings. So from this branch right here, it continues onward. And from this branch, we continue through one of the greatest successes of Satan, the Counter-Reformation. The Counter-Reformation. The Counter-Reformation started by Ignatius de Loyola. He was the founder of the Jesuits. The devil was going to raise a demonic army. And these guys weren't preachers. These guys were intellectuals. These guys were the scholars. And the devil was going to raise these men to conquer against this, the preachers, the Great Awakening revivals. Ignatius de Loyola, as he founded the Jesuit order, he was going to counter-attack. They were so sick and tired of this. They were so sick and tired of this book that brought the revivals, that brought great awakenings. In fact, one Catholic Jesuit cried about the King James Bible. The Bible, that serpent with head erect and eyes flashing, threatens us with its venom while it trails along the ground, shall be changed into a rod as soon as we are able to seize it. For three centuries past, that's right, for three centuries past, this cruel asp left us no repose. You well know with what folds it entwines us and with what fangs it gnaws us. So thus they began their counterattack against the King James Bible. Ignatius de Loyola, he founded the Jesuit order to counterattack. This man went through four inquisitions. This is how demonic and scary these people are, all right? The Jesuits. This man, he went through four inquisitions to prove his Catholic devotion. Didn't you know that? He went through four different inquisitions to prove his Catholic devotion. Demonically enslaved. In fact, his spiritual exercises book taught brainwashing and control of his followers, including the very air that they breathe. That's how strong the brainwashing control was of the Jesuits and Loyola. And the Jesuits started to counterattack. You know, so I'm going to add this. This is not mentioned in my previous history, so I'm going to add this one. So the devil started attacking, and how he started to attack is through secular powers. Here came in the elites. Uh, the Jesuits started to counterattack. They were being kicked out by Catholic nations. Ever remember the KJV translator translation? Their plot failed. So they were getting kicked out, kicked out, kicked out. They were losing power. Catholic nations were even kicking them out. Didn't you know even the Vatican kicked them out? The Pope and the Vatican finally kicked them out. And the Jesuits knew that they lost their power and they had to regain it. So it is said that the Jesuits, how they regained their power, they used the ones who were still in power that time in leading. The Masons. They used the high-ranking Masons that time. And there they found Rothschild as well. Through Rothschild and the Masons, the Masonic Oath was founded in 
Pennsylvania Jesuit University. Rothschild and Adam Weishaupt, who founded the Illuminati, which eventually produced all kinds of elites that came out eventually, all came out, was started in a Jesuit university. From there, when the birth of America came to the scene, that's where Benjamin Franklin and some of the people, you'll see Masonic symbols all over the government. Although God founded, Amer although God's hand was upon the founding of America and started the revivals, Satan was on its coattails to produce some greater evil behind the scene. That's where the great elite powers came from. The Jesuits say regained their power through one powerful figure, Napoleon Bonaparte. Through Napoleon Bonaparte, they used that man where they founded, the, where they got the Knights of Malta and other high organizations going. Napoleon started to conquer Catholic nation, Catholic nation. Jesuits were doing assassinations through the Catholic royalty. And through that, Napoleon got the Pope into prison and forced him to restore the Jesuit order. That's how the Jesuit order reclaimed its power. And from there, that's where all the high elites from Rothschild and the Masons and other high-ranking Jews, they all came from this bunch. Why? Because it started out through something demonic, something sinister. It came from the Jesuits. Through there, the devil is going underground with these elites. While the people were rejoicing, souls were getting saved, he was going underground, slowly building up his power through high-ranking elites. You got the elites. Political power fell. So, polit so political power fell through these figures. Now he's got to attack this book. The, K the King James Bible also fell. The King James Bible also fell. How? Through higher and lower criticism. The Jesuits plan. They always go 50 to 100 years ahead of time. So while everyone was going on through their great reformation, in came those Jesuits behind the scenes, planning a bigger plot. They were quiet from the 1500s to the 1900s to successfully destroy the King James Bible-believing churches today. They decided to attack by infiltrating schools. It is estimated that they infiltrated more than a hundred school, more than hundred schools and university, more than a hundred schools and universities. These Jesuits infiltrated. They first raised up questions against the Bible's authenticity through higher and lower criticism in France. That's where they started. That's where Voltaire, that's where all the great enlightenment, great awakening, man, not the enlightenment, but the great, while the great awakening was going, they got their great enlightenment going. And through that, because they respected intellectual scholarship so much, that's what the Jesuits used. So they started to go through France first. Through France, they started to question the Bible. See, if you want to get rid of revival, you got to get rid of, rid of a revival by getting rid of the book. So question the authenticity of the book first. Through higher and lower criticism in France, they had the French Enlightenment. Then it spread to Germany, the heart of Luther's Reformation. That's where German rationalism came from. So guess what? The Jesuits, who were brilliant intellectuals, they took advantage of that. Then guess what? It eventually went to where? The heart of the Reformation, Germany. Then it went to England, the heart of the King James Bible. The heart of the King James Bible in England. And that's where you had English deism, right? English deism. See, always intellectual, intellectual. See how the devil used it? Then he finally went to America, the heart of the Great Awakening Revival. You see how Satan slurred behind the scenes? Because God started where? The Reformation in Germany. Then he moved to England. Then he went to America. Satan realized this. Let's go behind and knock them out one by one. Welcome to America today. So question, question the Bible. But it didn't go into apostasy like that. It just started out with questioning the Bible. Then you got those stinking philosophers who came in. The philosophers, they took the higher and lower criticism against the KJV. They took the higher and lower criticism attack of the KJV from the Jesuits from France, Germany, and the philosophers who were intellectuals shared some of their beliefs and they use that to not just attack the Bible now, but to attack Christianity itself. You see a little leaven leaven at the whole lump. And that's how Satan succeeds in making the whole world apostate. 
They revived. See, all the way. Don't forget Satan's headquarters. You can't forget Alexandria and Rome. You can't forget that. Satan revived its system once more. Through the revival of that system, they came up with their own human philosophies that critiqued the Bible. You had David Hume, John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, Rene Descartes, Francis Bacon, Friedrich Nietzsche. Because the Jesuits were spreading criticisms against the Bible with higher and lower criticism, they took some of that argument and changed it into what? Humanism and Christian modernism. So what happened after that? Now you got the schools that fell. So schools fell. Schools were not safe. Political power was not safe. Then you got another person. Who was he? Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin came to the scene. And what he, he, you know what? He was actually a, the, a student who majored in theology. So the devil kept his eyes on some people who were grown up and raised in Christianity. And he was going to use them for his glory, the devil. And the devil kept an eye on them. And God forbid it will happen to anyone here. But it is happening right now today. That's what the devil's doing. He's keeping an eye on you. And he kept an eye on Darwin. But he started to question our creation with Origin of Species, his book. Now you finally had a scientific way to get rid of God. So what do you think the atheists, the secular humanists did? They took advantage of that. Now they have a scientific argument against God. They joined the bandwagon and they used that to critique the Great Awakening revival preachings and promote their evolution ideas more. And guess what happened? Science fell. Science fell. I think the guy's name is Spencer. I'm not sure. But Spencer, he even said this. If you get rid of evolution, then we are forced to follow the moral rules of what Christianity has preached about. And I refuse to do that. See, now science fell. That's why they joined that bandwagon. Now, higher and lower criticism start to open doors. Now the Bible completely fell with these guys, Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort knocked off the King James Bible. They said, let's make a new English Bible. So the first modern Bi English modern Bible after the KJV was the revised version. With the revised version, you know what they took? Back at Alexandria. They took the manuscripts back at Alexandria. And through this, they took the manuscripts and started to build up modern Bibles from that. And guess what they did? It opened the door for others to make their own revisions of the KJV. Do you not realize that from Westcott and Hort, when they, once they opened the doors, you know how many modern versions came out since then? More than 200 different English Bibles. How much more? How much more do you need to correct that book, huh? See? So guess what happened? Significant. The Bible fell. The Bible fell after that. When the Bible fell, then the devil started to raise up another one. Oh, here came Karl Marx. Karl Marx. And when Karl Marx came to the scene, he started to promote the ideas where communism came from. He created socialism on how the government was not getting control of making sure everyone had an equal wealth. Since he was a journalist, he had the power of the media to spread his propaganda. Many sinners convicted by the Great Awakening preaching, they wanted the government to take care of them. <coughs> Excuse me. So his beliefs attracted them. So instead of working for themselves, which endangered many to fall prey and being dependent on the government. Just like what? Just like, remember deja vu back then? Let's trust this government here. They're the ones that can take care of us. They're the ones that know what they're doing. See what Satan was doing? He's trying to revive what he did back then. And he used Karl Marx to do it. And guess what? Karl Marx, guess what? Just like Darwin. You know where he was raised under a Christian branch. He was a Lutheran. See, Satan will keep an eye on you. And guess what happened? Because of that, government fell. So the devil was raising up one by one by one. Then you got Hollywood. That blasted Hollywood. Hollywood came to the scene. And you know what? You'd be surprised. A lot of the famous stars and actors and musicians, didn't you know they were all, a lot of them were raised from Christian churches? But how did they fall? How did they be, 
uh, fall into sin and promote sin and glamorize sin and start to get the younger generations to endorse sin because of this blasted thing called Hollywood. And Hollywood glamorized sin. It glamorized the worldly music. It glamorized the worldly dressing. It glamorized the world. It glamorized sin. And be glamorized fornication. And because of that, some of them, you got, you'd be surprised. Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis Presley, some of those people, they were raised up in uh, Christian churches. But what happened? The devil started to put in Hollywood where they want to become stars, famous, and promote sin. In fact, it's really sad when you hear some of Elvis Presley's music. He was struggling with sin. He, he even confessed in one of his songs, you can tell. He was struggling with his sin. So because of that, Christianity was starting to die out in morals and worldliness was being promoted. That's why you got young generations today who act, who talk, who dress, who like the music and the taste of what? What Hollywood is doing. If you don't believe me, just look at them then and look at yourself. Don't you share a lot in common with them? See that? So, the, so what happened? The world fell. The world fell. So that's how the devil used Hollywood. In fact, what's very interesting as well is that at the birth of Hollywood, a lot of it was from those elites that came through the scenes. A lot of them were Masons, and some of them were those Jews who were connected with the Jesuit elites. So guess what? Propaganda and garbage and wickedness was spreading even more and more. Another person the devil used was Sigmund Freud. Freud came to the scene. And Freud, when he came to the scene, he started to give psychological explanations for human guilt. And he criticized the kind of this kind of preaching. You know that? He criticized that. Why? Because you're not helping them out. Don't produce human guilt. That's his philosophy. And he started to give this psychological babble where people start to sear their conscience with a hot iron. So when the Great Awakening preachers start to convict these people of sin, they got an explanation away through Freud. And guess what? Conscience fell. Nothing was safe anymore. Now you got another one. Okay. The devil's not done. See what he's setting up one by one by one. Then came the cults. While the Great Awakenings, Christianity was the dominant mainstream. Protestant Christianity was the dominant mainstream. But then the cults came in. And these cults started to come in during that time period. The Mormons through Brigham Young sprouted out in Utah. Jehovah's Witnesses by Charles Russell sprouted out in New York. Christian Science by Mary Baker Eddy. Seventh-day Adventism by Ellen G. White. The Church of Christ by Alexander Campbell sprouted all over the South. The Charismatic with their healings and speaking of tongues sprouted out in California. The hyper-dispensationalists by Cornelius Stamm and New Jersey. And due to this mess of so many what? What, what, what do they all say? We're Christian. You, you hear that, right? We're Christian. We're Christian. We're Christian. We're Christian. With this whole mess going on of everyone professing to be a Christian, guess what happened? Finally, people today are so sick and tired of it, seeing Christians fighting amongst themselves. Let's put aside our differences, unite together under the banner of Christianity, and the Pope, the Vatican, finally succeeded in getting all the churches to what? To, to join together, and the Pope would host these events in the Vatican with the Christian religions and the world religions together, and thus hosted by the Pope. Why? To go back to what the devil always wanted to do. He wanted, he's going to get Rome to be in power once more at Revelation 17. He wanted all these sins to start spreading out. Mother Church was making a comeback ever since what? The time of Jesus Christ. Pagan Rome followed its coattails all the way. So guess what happened now? Now churches fell. Churches fell. Now let me close it right here. Let me ask you this one question. All right? If you got political powers that fall today, political high rich powers that fall today, you got the government that fall, you got the schools that fall, you got the Bible that fell away, science fell away, the whole world falling away, churches falling away. Not only that, 
If there's nothing else to turn to but your own conscience, but you got your conscience falling away, what will save you from and give you Bible-believing truth? Absolutely nothing. Amen. Absolutely nothing. The devil covered all bases so that no one can find Bible-believing truth anywhere. Even if you're not deceived by political powers, he'll use your conscience to deceive you. Even if you have the right Bible, he'll use the schools to make you critique the Bible eventually. If you're not deceived by the government, he'll use the churches you go to to deceive you. Absolutely nothing was saved. And God forbid that any one of you Christians out there are caught and deceived by that mess. So the churches fell. The churches fell. So nothing was safe anymore. The devil succeeded. Thus, his counter-reformation and modernism, which eventually led to modernism, it all spread out. And thus the Great Awakenings fell away as we hit the 20th and 21st century. But the Lord raised up a few good men during these last days to fight against the counter-reformation and modernism today, which we come into eventually. Because of all the apostasy that's happening, as you know, there is nothing safe to turn to. Science fell, schools fell, government fell, uh, secular powers have fallen, uh, the Bibles fell. And because of that, there was no place safe to turn to. So that's how the devil finally succeeded. He finally succeeded with the counter-reformation and modernism. So this counter-reformation, which was led by Loyola, it eventually led to the modernism mess that we had today. So as you might recall, the Jesuits, they were kicked out of power, but they start to regain their power slowly, one by one, uh, through Rothschild, Masons, the high elites, and then through Napoleon. Once they regained their power, the Jesuits went underground through the French Enlightenment, uh, and they went through German rationalism and English deism. Schools is the best way to always ruin the next generation. Right. So, so through the schools, they gave textual criticism, doubting the authenticity of the Bible. The philosophers who did not believe in Christianity, they took advantage of those skepticism arguments that the Jesuits opened up and used it to build even more to denounce Christianity. Then Charles Darwin came, and then he produced evolution. Karl Marx with socialism, which eventually led into communism. And then Westcott and Hort produced different Bibles. And then Sigmund Freud to give doubt on your conscience and questioning morals, and then it just fell away. That's how modernism was produced. Modernism produced. So in this day and age, there seemed to be no one that can fight against this. It seemed like all hope was lost. And the Lord let, raised up a few good men. These were the people during the last days of Laodicea. If it weren't for these men, then we would not exist today. Bible believers came to exist because of these men. All right, this is how Bible believers came to exist. The first thing was concerning the King James Bible issue. The Lord raised up two good men to denounce the critical text that the Jesuits and other textual scholars were using to criticize the text of the King James Bible. And one of them was Dean Bergen. Dean Bergen, he was contemporary with Westcott and Hort. He lived during those days. Dean Bergen took the text of Westcott and Hort and tore it apart. He tore it apart. This man is a scholar, Dean of Chichester, Oxford scholar, and then defended successfully the King James Bible. Then the Lord raised up a man who studied in Harvard, Edward F. Hills. Edward F. Hills also successfully defended the manuscripts of the King James Bible. If you read his works, it's pretty brilliant. If some people mistakenly think that I'm smart in defending the KJV, that's not the case. It's because I use a lot from Edward F. Hill's work. He did a successful job defending the text of the King James Bible. So significance, the Bible was defended. So remember, counter-reformation and modernism just tore everything apart. So the key thing was the Bible. Remember, after the King James Bible came out, that's when the Great Awakening started to come out, right? But then when they start to, when did it all start to fall apart? 
when the Jesuits went through French Enlightenment and German rationalism, e English deism, questioning the authenticity of the Bible. See, that's how it begins. So then that foundation was laid. So the Bible was defended. That's significant to attack this. That was significant. The second thing that was significant is doctrine. And the Lord raised up these two good men, C.I. Schofield and Clarence Larkin. C.I. Schofield, he was contemporary during the days of D.L. Moody. As you remember, D.L. Moody was one of those great awakening preachers. C.I. Schofield, he took over one of D.L. Moody's churches and he pastored successfully. But C.I. Schofield, if you read his story about his reference Bible, it's amazing how the Lord defended it. One time he was about... There were two cases where he almost lost his Schofield reference Bible. One time uh, he was at a trip through the Atlantic and he was very careful and paranoid about his reference Bible because of the devil's attack. So he wanted somebody to check down the containers and see if his reference Bible was there. But guess what? It was lost. So <laughs> during those days, during those old days, when you cross through the ocean, you don't want to lose containers that time. All right? You can lose it. So he had to <coughs> trace his steps and the Lord protected it. The second time... <coughs> He had his printing work and all of his reference Bible notes and everything set up, but there was a fire, and he panicked, and he thought that his reference Bible was lost, but the fire burned right next to his reference Bible. So the Lord protected it a second time. C.I. Schofield was a drunken lawyer. He was a drunken lawyer. But you know how he got saved? One person asked him, Are you, a, are you born again? Are you saved, Christian? And Schofield, he said, well, you know, I drink. I don't think God allows drunkards into heaven, right? And that guy said, I didn't ask you that. I asked you, are you saved? Are you a Christian? And that's how C.I. Schofield received Christ for his salvation. Clarence Larkin, what made him the, the classical work on dispensationalism is because of his charts. He was an engineering and he's a Baptist minister. So these, such a great combination made him a champion drawing many charts on dispensationalism. He drew scores of charts. If you still look at his charts today, it's still a Bible study that you can learn out of just by looking at his charts. The Lord used Clarence Larkin, a Baptist minister mightily, to produce dispensationalism charts. So because of dispensationalism, right doctrine was defended. As you recall, there were many cults during this time. I already listed to you. Churches were falling apart left and right. So because of these two men, the Lord raised it to defend right doctrine. So significant, significant is Bible protected and right doctrine defected. I mean, de not defected, it was defended. So both of these were defended. Then the Lord raised up these bunch. This is where the fundamentalists come from. And then where the liberal media demonizes these people. If it weren't for these men, then we would have fell prey to the world. R.A. Torrey, he was another contemporary of D.L. Moody. It's amazing how God mightily used D.L. Moody, right? A lot of good men that came out. But R.A. Torrey came to the scene. And during that time, that's when modernism was seeping throughout schools and churches and pastors. R.A. Torrey, he got a bunch of preachers together. Biola University was founded on R.A. Torrey, actually. Now look what happened to it, huh? But anyway, R.A. Torrey, he came up with volumes. These were volumes of books, so they wrote a lot. Volumes combined a whole bunch of preachers together and called it the fundamentals. Thus, fundamentalists came to the scene. In other words, we defend the major fundamental doctrines of Christianity. So because of that, that's how we Baptist fundamentalists came to the scene, if it weren't for these men. As a result, it attacked the worldliness. Remember, during this time period, worldliness was affecting, right, everything. Hollywood just glamorized the wickedness of the world and sin. So because of these men, they preached against the worldliness, against sin. Sigmund Freud obviously didn't like this bunch. 
And these guys were the ones who woke up the spiritual conscience. So the significance is that it attacked the Catholic ecumenical movement. They were against the churches combining with modernism. And so the Lord raised these up to defend the churches. So the churches were defended. So significant. Churches didn't fall prey to the ecumenicalism that time. <clears throat> then major fundamentalists came to the scene that the Lord raised up. These fundamentalists, because of these men, they were able to raise up many, many pastors and churches that avoided the ecumenical movement. The Lord raised up men such as John R. Rice who wrote The Sword of the Lord. It's still the mo probably the most Baptist fundamentalist newspaper. The Lord raised up Bob Jones Sr. who founded Bob Jones University. The Lord raised up Lee Robins Robertson with Tennessee Temple. Christian children, they were getting affected by the public schools. So then there was Arlen and Becca Horton's uh, Becca Academy, and they provided the best Christian school outside program, thus keeping them away from the world. Jack Hiles actually reached the top 15 largest churches. So then the Lord was raising up a lot of fundamentalist pastors. But the problem was this. The problem was the devil really did a big job on the counter-reformation and modernism. He did a successful job. So because of this job, you got to understand this, is that not all of these men were clean in doctrine. And they also had problems in their life too. And you can dig up a lot of dirt on some fundamentalist pastors. So because of that, it was not enough to successfully attack the counter-reformation and modernism. But what was the Lord doing? He was laying up foundation and foundation. There was one man who combined all of this together. And because of this man, he combined everything together. And then Bible believers start to sprout out really quick. Just like the Lord raised up, what people refuse to believe is that God will raise up a significant man who could change history. And that's what they refuse to believe. The Lord raised up Martin Luther. He changed a lot of history. The Lord raised up Anabaptists who were actually called extremists and radicals compared to the traditional Protestants. So that is normal throughout history how the Lord used. So thus the Lord raised up another significant figure who traditional fundamentalists consider as radical and extremist yeah. and who people refuse to believe would change history. His name was Peter S. Ruckman. Amen. Peter S. Ruckman, he was born right when Schofield died. When dispensationalism died with Schofield, he was born at that same day, and the same year, excuse me, and the Lord raised him. What did he do? This man combined everything together. That's right. And when he combined everything together, that's how we were successfully able to attack the modernism of today. He was a hopeless drunk, and he was actually going to commit suicide. Boy, did the Lord have other plans, didn't he? To change history. What happened was, is that a fundamental, one of the fundamentalist pastors named Hugh F. Pyle, Hugh Pyle, one of the fundamentalist pastors, caught Ruckman. And then Ruckman, uh, he was approached by Hugh Pyle, and then Ruckman said, well, what do you got? And Hugh Pyle told Ruckman, well, I got the Lord. What do you got? And then Ruckman, he didn't have anything. Hugh Pyle gave Ruckman the gospel. And Ruckman, at that time, when he was a hopeless drunk about to commit suicide, he, got, he bowed his head and received Christ for salvation. His salvation testimony is kind of funny. Because he was such a wicked, wicked man, he didn't know how to speak clean yet. So he would always curse. So out of the sincerity of his heart to the Lord, he prayed like this. Lord God, I know that I'm such a blankety blank blank sinner and I deserve a blankety blank blank hell. But God, I know that salvation is real. I pray that you'll save my blankety blank blank soul from hell. And then the fundamentalist pastor, Hugh Pyle, was laughing. And he said, did you mean that with all your heart? And Ruckman said, you better blankety blank blank right I did. <laughs> the Lord changed his life. Old things were passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He changed his image completely. If you looked at his old image, he looked totally different. And then he got himself, he shaved himself, got a clean haircut. 
made himself clean, and then he surrendered himself to the ministry. He became a pastor, and he received his doctorate from one of the fundamentalists, Bob Jones University. He received his doctorate from there. He was praised by Bouchamp Vic. Bouchamp Vic was one of the kings of the fundamentalists at that time. Bouchamp Vic founded the Baptist Bible Fellowship. It was the world's largest Baptist fundamentalist at that time. Bouchamp Vic praised Peter Ruckman of being the greatest Bible teacher in America. And Bob Jones Sr. said about Ruckman, one of the most brilliant students ever walked on his campus. In fact, John R. Rice, the fundamentalist John R. Rice, he advertised Dr. Ruckman in his Sword of the Lord magazine and said, this man will answer your questions in 45 seconds or less. You can still, pro you can still find it online, that article image. So the Lord raised him up. Ruckman... What he did was that what, why the fundamentalists considered him a radical is because these guys didn't combine everything together and go all the way. Ruckman, he combined all of this together and he went all the way. He went all the way. Amen. So he chewed out West God and Hort. He chewed out every pastor. And he even chewed out fundamentalist pastors who messed up. Boy, they did not like this guy. But why did the Lord raise him up? It was important for the last days. The last days was infected with so much of modernism. The counter-reformation and modernism done its work. The Lord raised up this man to clean up the piss and the dung that was going on at Laodicea at that time. He was doing the cleanup. The Lord didn't raise him up to build mega churches or to get thousands on the altar like Billy Sunday. God had a different plan for him. You're going to clean house. And that's what Ruckman did. He cleaned house. He, de he debated many people. He debated a famous Catholic apologist, a lawyer named Carl Keating. In fact, when he debated him, it, he crushed him so badly with documentations that in the middle of the break, when Dr. Rutman was, was quoting documentations of this pope messed up, this bishop messed up, these priests lined up in front of Carl Keating and they said, is that true what he said? Is that true what he said? <laughs> there was a, another debate with Earl Calland. He was the best Bible version during those days, and I think it's still one of the top Bible versions, the NIV. And Dr. Ottman took one of its committee members, Earl Callan, and debated him. That was not even a debate. You actually would feel sorry for Earl Callan. He was crushed and humiliated. That was the worst debate I ever saw. I'm not going to watch that again. <laughs> Then another, in another debate, he went up against a biology evolution professor. And in this debate, he gave documentations and documentations. And what did that professor do at the end? The news media lined up and they recorded him. You know what that biology evolution professor said at the end about Ruckman? He didn't, he didn't debate him on certain areas and critique certain areas where he was wrong. All he could do was just say this. He was just misquoting those sources. That was all he could say. How many of you heard evolutionists do that huh, during debate? So that's all they could do. They can't go against the argument itself. He wrote tons of books and articles and videos that filled more than seven shelves. In fact, one of Dr. Ruckman's avid enemies, he's still actually online. Ded this guy dedicated a whole website to critique Dr. Ruckman. In fact, this critic, he had to admit, he said this about Ruckman. One thing about Ruckman is that he's not a lazy man, <laughs> after looking at all those books. The evidence to prove the wealth of information and Bible-believing truth and the intelligence is all you have to do is go look at his bookstore, www.kjv1611.org. All you have to do is look at that bookstore. Then you'll know that that guy armed himself in everything, on every cult, religion, King James Bible issue, and uh, evolution, atheism, got it all. All in that bookstore. I would recommend anyone out there to please order stuff from his bookstore. Please order stuff from his bookstore. He got everything in there. So, just like, what did the enemies do during history? If you study Bible-believing history, what would the enemies do? They called John Huss's followers Hussites. They called Luther's followers Lutherans. And what did, they called Wycliffe's followers Lollards. And guess what they called people who studied under Dr. Ruckman's work? Ruckmanites. Thus, you'll hear that term very infamously used, Ruckmanites, today. 
So why? It's because that's what the enemies of God do. Enemies of God, they will try to create it into a cult and make it into a following. Yeah. But all you have to do is not just look at biased sources throughout the internet and then what they point out, his flaw and that flaw. Can I tell you something? Even if this guy has so many flaws, well, not just so many, but if even this guy has flaws, study your Bible-believing history. Everyone has flaws. Amen. Everyone has flaws. But the there's no doubt the Lord used Luther, he used Tory, Schofield, Bergen, Hills, Ruckman, and everybody. And God used imperfect men with flaws mightily for His glory. And if there's one thing that God used Ruckman on was intelligence. It was Bible-believing truth. And if you people are going to reject that just because of this cuss word name called Ruckman, just because of this name, you're missing out everything. That's, right. That's how the devil's going to deceive you and blind you, people who are watching online. Some people were saying, you're too smart to, to listen to this guy. Why are, you, why are you listening to this guy? I listen to your teachings. You're too smart to follow him. It's because you don't even look at the bookstore. You didn't even read that stuff. You just look at stuff online, biased sources, and pointing out his flaw, his flaw, his flaw, man. You better thank God that there's no internet finding your flaw <laughs> before you point out this guy's flaw. Now what happened? The gates of heaven opened up and the gates of hell got heyday. In came the Bible believers. The Bible believers came to the scene. And when these Bible believers came to the scene, please do not run out of ink. <laughs> when these Bible believers came to the scene, the Lord raised up good men to defend Christianity and doctrinal truths. Hold on. What happened? The foundation was laid. Now that the foundation was laid, now the Lord was going to start His counterattack. They had their counter-reformation. We're going to counter that one now. In came the Bible believers. That's where we came in. The Lord raised up one man named William Grady. William Grady, he actually pastored the largest fundamentalist university, Jack Hiles. He was actually a professor. Excuse me. He taught one of its classes over there. He was a professor of the largest fundamentalist university in Hiles that time. But then what happened was that somebody gave him one of the poisonous books from Dr. Ruckman called Manuscript Evidence. When he read that, it changed his life to defend the King James Bible. And what that man did was, when he went to one particular fundamentalist university, he mentioned that cuss word. He mentioned Ruckman. And he defended him for over an hour. Boy, the, the, it's still online. You can watch that video. Boy, the, the people People at that school, they got scared. They got tense after that. It's such a rich view. You should watch it. And the Lord raised up another person. He raised up Jack Chick. Jack Chick, that time, he had a burden for lost souls. But he was scared and he was a shy man. But what he decided to do was to draw artwork and use that as track material. His first, his studio, his track project studio, was in his little kitchen. That's how he started his Chick Tracks. He would sometimes contact Ruckman for doctrinal questions. They became fast friends. You know what, how the Lord used him? It's still at the Smithsonian Institute today. He is known as the world's most published author. The world's most published author. The Lord mightily used him. And because, well, the Vatican, they got Mordecai Ham, long gone and dead. J. Frank Norris, long gone and dead. The two of the four horsemen of Revelation are not dead, but the third one raised its ugly head, and the Vatican marked him out. And in fact, if you go to Catholic conferences and you pass them out chick tracks, they know what they are and they will avoid it. That's what the, that's what the Jesuits, the priests, have taught them to do. Jack Chick became infamous. And the Lord raised up people after people. Another person came out named Sam Gipp. He graduated from Dr. Ruckman's school. And he wrote the simplest yet thorough defense against the King James Bible. 
The Lord raised him up as this kind of talent. His talent was this, to take the intellectual scholar's material and to make and to dumb it down to the average man's level. And now the intellectual scholars got their nightmare. They got their own church members questioning their teachings about Greek and Hebrew. His book, The Answer Book, was selling out like hotcakes. The Lord raised him up to do that. Now simple common men, who some of them who didn't even graduate from high school, started to critique their own Greek and Hebrew pastors and intellectuals. Lord was raising up preacher after preacher. Another person that God raised up was David Peacock. David Peacock, he was a captain of a police force, and then he surrendered himself to preach for the ministry. He is known as the one of the best preachers today on using illustrations. He is very illustrative in his preaching. He's the head... He is the head of the Bible Doctrine Institute, which is the best Bible-believing online course today. And we have it in our resources site. One time when he was preaching about casting crowns at Jesus' feet, a bunch of these church members got excited and they started to take off their shoes and throw it down on the ground, pretending that they were casting crowns at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. God was raising up preachers. God was raising up men. Another one God raised up was Billy Eubanks. He also attended Dr. Ruckman's school. This man, he did the crazy task of taking Jack Chick's materials, I think about 10,000 Chick tracks, and he flew over the Vatican at one of their sacred Catholic days, and he opened up the bins and spilled down 10,000 Chick tracks all over the Vatican that time. That, and then, now he can't go back to Italy anymore, I think, after that. <laughs> The Lord was raising up men after men. Another person God raised up was Greg Estep. Greg Estep was a man who founded a, uh, another good Bible school at Ohio. And he started to train them in Bible-believing dispensationalism and the King James Bible issue. And then the Lord raised up another good man at Ohio, Jimmy Hood. Jimmy Hood, he started a rescue mission up in Ohio, taking drunks, men, cursed by drugs and wickedness, got them cleaned up, took them in his rescue mission, and they became street preachers as well. Amen. Took, taking a bunch of drunks, turning them that's into street good. preachers. That's good stuff, amen. Then God raised up another man named Jack Patterson. Jack Patterson, he started a home for boys. And he would take these teenagers who are also abandoned, hurt, ruined by the wickedness of sin and the world. And while the world was grabbing away teenagers, making them fall more and more or less, into it, they were falling into immorality, into wickedness and corruption. Jack Patterson took those kids ruined by that mess, ruined by Hollywood, ruined by the world, ruined by society, and cleaned them up and raised them up into godly Christian living. In fact, if you look at some of these people, when they go up in front of churches, oh boy, it will melt your heart. These young teens, they would sing out hymns for the Lord Jesus Christ all in a group together who were once ruined and abandoned and fell into sin, now cleaned up, dressed properly in church, singing hymns and quoting chapters and chapters and chapters of Psalms, different portions of the Scriptures. Lord raised up another man named David Spurgeon. David Spurgeon, he was part of a mean gang that rivaled the Hell's Angels. In fact, he was one of the top leaders. But finally, the feds got him. The feds got him and arrested him. He one time broke a man in half. This man is covered with tattoos all over his body. But man, one time the Lord spoke on his heart. And the Lord dealed with his heart. Some of the people connected with Greg E. Stepp's ministry got a hold of this person right here. And David Spurgeon, while he was sometime at solitary confinement, I believe, or sometime at prison, the Lord started to warm his heart and somebody told him about the plan of salvation. And he got saved. That man who had crimes filling up the shelf and he was doomed to imprisonment for many years, the judge saw him all cleaned up, life changed, and one of the churches who fellowship with Greg E. Stepp supporting him, and that judge said, you know what, I believe you are a changed man. You went out free and that man is now evangelizing throughout churches, 
preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ today. That man, when you see him, you'll see him fully suit. Why? Because if you raise up his, uh, if you raise up the sleeve, you'll see tattoos all over. He covered it all with former, with formal Sunday dressing. He was a changed man. The Lord changed this man's life. Another person that God raised up was Vince Massa. Now, I'm not sure if this story is true or not, but from what I heard is that Vince Massa... Now, I do know this. He attended one of the fundamentalist schools, a famous fundamentalist pastor named Tom Malone. But then Vince Massa, one time he heard that Dr. Rutland was preaching in one of the conferences nearby the school, so he would teach class. He would sneak out sometimes at night, and then that way he could sneak and hear Dr. Rutland preach and teach. Vince Massa, he was known to be... Uh, he's known to be as a very great preacher. He can be a very dramatic preacher too. Sometimes you will see him when he's preaching, he will point his long bony finger right at you and put his leg on top of the pulpit and go down on you like this. One time he, when he was preaching, he one time broke the pulpit one time while he was preaching. But that was a crazy guy who went with him. If you put these two together, it would be quite a scene. But this guy sadly passed away. James Lentz. James Lentz. I heard that when that guy preach, he jumped off the stage one time and hurt his leg, or broke his leg one time. Vince Massa broke the pulpit, Lentz broke his leg. <laughs> James Lentz, he was the one that another man that the Lord mightily used. He also graduated from Dr. Upman's school. Now this guy, he was one of those rough preachers, one of those rough preachers, like you would see Peter Cartwright and other people of the old days. James Lindsay started a church at North Carolina. North Carolina churches knew this guy, and they called him a heretic, and they wanted the people to stay away from him. He was street preaching with several of his members, but then the people hated that. So then the sheriff and the state's hired preacher tried to persuade him to stop. And then the sheriff one time went to Lindsay and said, You got to stop, stop. And Lindsay, no. I who do you think you are? And Lynn said, I'm just the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And then the sheriff finally, he went to him again, and this time he started to use the sob story. The sheriff said, you know, I got a wife. I got kids to feed. And man, people are trying to tell me for you to stop. I mean, can't you back off a bit, you know? Lynn, he looked at that sheriff and he said, I can't do that, sir. And the sheriff's like, why not? And Lynn said, because you have your higher up to be held accountable to, I have a bigger higher up that I'm going to be held accountable to. <laughs> he went off. Then they had the state's higher preacher come in. And he was, of course, an older gentleman who knew better. And he went to Lince and he said, you know, that kind of street preaching stuff, it don't work, you know. It don't work. And Lince said, it doesn't work. And then the old man said, I used to be young, zealous, passionate like you. But I'm telling you what, times have changed. And this kind of stuff, that's not how you reach people. You won't get people saved. And then Lentz, he saw one of his church members leading this African-American salvation. And this big, tall African-American was crying. And he said, Lord Jesus Christ, I receive you as my Lord and personal Savior. Save my soul from hell. And Lentz, when he saw that, he pointed his finger at that guy to the old man. And he said, you see that? I'll tell you what, Grandpa. It really works. It really works. You better get out of here before I beat the fire out of you. And that old man started to back up. And that old man said, I, I knew it. You got devils. You got devils. You got devils. And Lentz said, you're right. I got devils. You better get out of here before I give you some. <laughs> So the Lord raised up a wild man named James Lentz. He's actually my favorite preacher. He's actually my favorite preacher. I don't care what you say. I, I like those kind of guys how the Lord uses. Amen. He uses everybody, amen? amen? He uses anybody and everybody. And you've already saw that throughout history, right? And God is still doing that today. He's still looking for a few good men out there, a few good women of God out there that he can use for his glory. The Lord raised up many other people. The Lord also raised up Wil uh, Wilson Calvin. Wilson Calvin. He's an Indian, a Native American. He still ministers to those Indians in Arizona. While he's ministering to those Indians in Arizona, one time he was preaching the gospel and he was outside. And one of those atheists went up to Wilson Calvin and he said, There is no God. 
And that Native American, Wilson Calvin, said, There is no God. And he bowed on his knees and he said, Lord God, I pray that you will drop him dead right here and right now. And that atheist backed off and he said, I, I, You can't do that. You can't do that. He got scared. And then Calvin got up and he said, Gotcha. You believe in a God. <laughs> Wilson Calvin, he happened to know about Dr. Upman because when he went to this pers uh, particular friend's house, he saw a bunch of colorful books. And he said, these are very colorful and pretty. What are they? His commentaries. His commentaries. So the Lord raised up another Bible-believer, Wilson Calvin. The Lord also raised up Ted Warmack. Ted Warmack. Ted Warmack, he started to minister to the prisons. This man has gotten hundreds of prisoners saved. Hundreds. Hundreds of prisoners saved. And many people who would be ministered in his ministry. The best course that you would ever read called The Bread of Life. I would recommend that to anybody out there. Get The Bread of Life book. That book will cover all kinds of major doctrines, even deep doctrines, but give you the easiest way to understand. He will cover dispensationalism, the Genesis gap even. He'll cover all that. And he combined all the doctrines and put it in an easy format. The Lord raised up Ted Warmack to minister to the prisons. So while the prisoners were being ruined by wickedness and sin, and the devil had them in prison and in depression, the Lord raised him up, him up to minister to those kind of broken people, the outcasts. And the Lord raised up another person named David Walker. David Walker was a graduate of Dr. Ruckman's school. He became one of the leading figures to, def uh, to defend dispensationalism today. I think his new book just recently came out. It's called The Bible Believer's Guide to Dispensationalism. That man studied dispensationalism intensely more than I did. And that guy goes through documentations and facts and defends the dispensationalism, doctrinal issues. He defends the Bible successfully. One time when he was outside ministering to people and street preaching, one of those people pointed his finger at David Walker and he said, Who do you think you are, man? Where would you be right now? Who do you think you are? What are you doing right now, doing this kind of stuff? And Walker, you know what he did? He just looked at him and this is how the Lord used a different method. He looked at him and he said, I would be like you right now. Where would I be? I would have been like you right now if I had not received Jesus Christ for salvation. That's where I would be. The Lord was using different people in different ministries, raising up in different ways. Another person the Lord raised up was Gail Ripplinger. The God had to use a woman to kick intellectual men. You know why? Because a bunch of stinking men they start to critique the King James Bible. So the Lord had to humiliate these men by using a woman named Gail Ripplinger. Gail Ripplinger came out and with her New Age Bible versions, that thing became probably the most popular book to defend the King James Bible issue. You know why? Because it demonized. It just demonized the modern version. Boy, man, they got mad after that. The modern versions, they had to hold a meeting at the John Ankerberg show and they had to discuss issues and warn people about her book. Her book was spreading like wildfire. Her first edition actually had the preface from Dr. Uckman. But then, uh, in order for her book to become popular, you had to not mention that name. So that's why her book became very, very widespread. In fact, because of how the Lord used her, one of the modern version Bible committees, Frank Logsdon, that guy got under... Con this is how the Lord used her. That modern version scholar who was responsible for one of the modern Bible versions, I think it was the NASV, Frank Logsdon said, I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord. That's right. You can believe the King James Bible is 100% perfect. Lord was raising people up. Bible believers, Bible believers were coming on. Another person God raised up was Alan Ryman. Yes, he's still alive, praise the Lord. And yes, he's a wild man. You know where he's ministering at? <laughs> Catholic Delaware. <laughs> Catholic Delaware. But this man has approximately, all, I think he has about 200 or more members in his church. So the Lord mightily used Ryman to minister to Catholic Delaware. If you minister up to the northeastern areas, you know how hard it is to build a church over there? It's extremely tough. But the Lord mightily raised him up to do that in Catholic Delaware. One time when he was outside street preaching, 
He dressed him. A bunch of these Catholics were giving him a hard time. So one time, Alan Ryman dressed up like a Catholic priest, and he was street preaching the gospel with the Catholic priest outfit. And then a bunch of these Catholics were going by saying, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. And then he was preaching the gospel. And the car passed by. I was like, What in the world? You know? And then they were giving a hard time before, but you can't say no now to a priest. So then this cop went by. I said, uh, uh, what are you doing? Are, are you sure you're a priest? And then Ryman looked at him all seriously, and he, and he said, what's her name, my child? And that cop went, and went away after that. And th there was this one guy who gave the street preachers a hard time, and I think he threw something at Ryman at, and the street preachers. But then what happened was that the, and the cops and the, some of the Catholics started to pounce on that guy and arrest him. And Ryman said, that's right, arrest him. He must be a Baptist. Arrest him. <laughs> So the Lord raised up another <laughs> crazy guy named Alan Ryman. Oh, I have to tell this other story. I just got to say this. this. This is just so funny. I, I could tell stories about these guys. Another time, Alan Ryman had a bunch of these young people. They had a fire for God. And they're like saying, man, we want a lot of people to come to church, Pastor. So one time they had these orange vests on and these cones. And then you know, uh, the street that led to the church, they all start to go like this to the cars and guide them like this, and all the cars start to go up to the church parking lot. And then Ryman's like, what is this? And they're like, hey, Pastor, we're helping you out. We're getting people into church. <laughs> oh, man, he's got a wild church. But anyway, uh, the Lord raised up very... Lord raised up Bible believers, Bible believers to shake things up. Another person God used was Gerald Sutek. Gerald Sutek, he had a street preaching ministry called SWAT Team for Christ. Through that, the Lord mightily used him to minister to throughout all the areas around America. The liberals, the cults, the religions, and started to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's now a missionary to the Philippines. How the Lord might, in fact, in Fox News even one time had to film him and his boys one time street preaching. That's how the Lord mightily used him. If you go to the Philippine Islands today, he, he sadly, I remember, he said this, there's a lot of Muslims over there, so please pray for them. They need the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of us were going, oh yeah, yeah, and you have to take it seriously, you know. And if you're ministering to a Muslim community, you can't say a lot of things freely, right? Like Lentz and Ryman would do. So Sutek was saying an example of how they're street preaching. So yeah, we street preach, you know, Muslims walk by and they listen to us. So we're like, oh, amen, amen. And we're like, I was assuming, yeah, he must have pre street preached carefully. And he said, yeah, we were preaching them, the Lord Jesus Christ, he loved you enough that he died for you on the cross to save you. And we were like, going, oh, amen, amen. Obviously you would say that. And then he started to say this. Yeah, and we say, Jesus Christ, he loved you enough to die for you. You know, he loved you more than Mohammed did. And Mohammed, no, he didn't love you enough to die for you. Mohammed might love your wife. He might love your daughter. And he might love your sister and the other sisters. But Jesus Christ loved you enough to die for you. We all dropped our jaws. And he said, and yeah, we still street preach. They let us street preach over there. Wow. <laughs> See how the Lord was mightily using these people? Lord was raising up Bible belief. I'm talking about today, folks. I'm talking about today. Right. This is Bible believers today. Amen. Genuine, real Bible believers today. We're not some kind of small cultic fringe. Yep. We number much more than Stephen Anderson out there and much more than a lot of those cultic pastors, modern age pastors who are starting their own movement. This is real, genuine Bible believers. Amen. Our history, you saw this pattern in history. We have a history, church. We have a history how the Lord used us. The Lord raised up good men, men after men. And people who say you can't be a Bible-believing, belie KJV, dispensational church and build a great work, that's not true. The Lord raised up a pastor named Rick Sow. He numbered somewhere between 500 to nearly 1,000 members in his church. And then the Lord raised up another pastor, Rick DeMichael. And Rick DeMichael, he would number somewhere between 1,000 to 1,500 in his church. So the Lord was raising, raising up, see, Bible believers, they're, they're around us, brethren. They're all around us. They're all around us, Bible-believing preachers. And if you think that's not enough, the Lord was raising up Bible believers around the world. This is not just America. This is around the world. The Lord raised up Bible-believing preachers around the world. And these names, these are not even all the names. They would fail to include these people. 
Joseph Anderson to Papua New Guinea, Daniel Bardwell to Ukraine, Chad Burnick to Alaska, Jeffrey Brigham to Japan, John Byer to Canada, Tyler Campbell to Scotland. Michael Cecil to Thailand, Paul Chichelchik, who's a medical missionary, Aaron Klippinger to the Chinese of Canada, Gabriel Cochran to Montreal, Robert Chris to the Philippines, Joel Dare to Brazil, Perry Demopoulos to Ukraine, Steve Dickens to England, Mark Dunlap to Mozambique, Craig Fitzgerald to Mongolia, Michael Flick to Malawi, Leonard Fogel to Israel, Daniel Grocki to Norway, Cameron Harris to Peru, Joel Hauser to Germany, Jason Hines to... Quebec City, Raymond Jones to Mexico, Edward Keo to Ukraine, Daniel Levita to Honduras, Joshua Lieb to Sicily, David Lether to Philippines, Dean Mazzaferi to Italy, Eric Michael to the Republic of Georgia, Jason Moore to Fiji, Marco Perez to Colombia, Chris Rosmondo to Malawi, David Robinson to Malawi, Philip Robinson to Chile, Matthew Schiraus to Brazil, Robert Trump to Germany, Nicholas Verhoff to Switzerland, Roger Vernos to the Philippines, Kenneth West to Ukraine, Richard Wiles to Ukraine, Michael Wolski to Poland, and these would fail to include other missionaries that I can't mention in India and China and communist Cuba and North Korea. Lord was raising up Bible believers. Amen. We're all over the world. Amen. We're all over the world. And then how it would lead to this small little church. The Lord raised up a man in Korea. Korea is very rich in Bible believing truth too. The Lord also raised up Song Lee. He numbered between four to five hundred members in his church. He has two hundred people street preaching. You think we're small. We're Bible believers all over. He got two hundred people street preaching and he got different groups. One for youth and one for the men. And then God knows whatever, whatever groups that he has. Lord raised up champions. He translated the King James Bible into Korean. And then from that we have approximately 10 or more pastors throughout the provinces of Korea and throughout the world as well. And the Lord raised up Kyung Kim. This man was a Buddhist drunk. He hated pastors, did not want anything to do with pastors. But for some weird reason, the Lord touched his heart. He heard Romans 10.9 and he received Christ for his salvation. That man took salvation seriously. He took his liquor bottle, dumped it all down the drain, and when this son was born, when Gene Kim was born, he never saw a drop of liquor in the fridge. Never at all in his entire life. And you know, when he got saved, that was when my mother was pregnant with me. And, that led, and then that led to me today. That led to me, growing up in a Bible-believing environment, rich in Bible-believing truth. I was spoiled. Why? Because these people gave sacrifices. That's right. Took great men of these to lay sacrifices to produce this person today. And thus we come to San Jose Bible Baptist Church and to you people online. Why? Because it started back from a history. These people laid the foundation. These people laid the foundation from the Great Awakening revivals through the Protestant Reformation all the way to the early centuries of Christianity who were where? They were in the lion's den holding hands, singing hymns together torn apart by lions. This is a history of Bible believers today. Hello, this is Pastor Gene Kim of San Jose Bible Baptist Church. Have you ever asked this question that if you were to die today are you 100% sure that you can go to heaven? My friend, it's so simple to get saved you first got to realize that you can't go to heaven because you've sinned against God. And God, as a holy judge, He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you feel sorry over your sinful condition. And if you do, there is hope for you. You see, Jesus, who is God, left heaven, came down here on earth, died on the cross, raised Himself from the dead. Why did He do all that? So His blood can wash away the sins for you. So you see, that's your only way to heaven, of what he did on the cross, and not what you do in cleaning up all your sins, and going to church, getting baptized, or doing any sort of good work. It's faith alone in what Jesus did on the cross. If you can do that, then all you have to do is say that to God. You might say, well, I don't know how to say it, can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. 
Dear God, I am sorry for being a sinner. I believe Jesus is God who died and resurrected so his blood can wash away my sins. I trust in that alone and not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend. If someone were to ask you, how did you get saved? It's very simple, right? What did you do? I just put my faith on what Jesus did on the cross. That's it. My friend, congratulations on your salvation. Right now, because Satan can't damn you to hell, what he's going to try to do now is try to ruin your life. And he did a very good job in this world. That's why it's so hard to find truth, and there are so many lies with a gazillion different churches, different Bibles, different beliefs, different religions. So my friend, it is so important to grow in truth and get involved in a Bible-believing work that can save you from a lot of trouble. There are four things we recommend for you to do, which is found in the resources link below. Number one, get involved in a Bible-believing church near you. Number two, study the King James Bible issue and have only that kind of Bible, no other modern version Bible. Number three, study dispensationalism so you can find the right doctrine and truth. Number four, study only under Bible-believing teachers. My friend, this is all explained further in the resources link below, so please click on it and get to work in a Bible-believing work because you only have one light to live for him and you don't want to waste it away by the devil. And I'll be inside that great palace and the smoke will be so thick, I'll drop to my knees and I'll drop to my face like those Navy SEALs do and I'll start crawling. I start crawling and I'll look down that uh, ivory aisle there and I'll see a, a throne and I'll see some feet that got holes in them and they got jewel sandals on. Then I'll pull myself up to those feet and I'll cry on those feet like that woman that cried on his feet wiped the tears with her hair. Hey, glory to God, you're going to let him do the shining. You're going to say, oh God, thank you. Hallelujah. And the angels will worship and the cherubim will worship and the seraphim will worship. And thank God an independent Baptist will worship. Another song said, Once I was straying in sin's dark valley, no hope within could I see. They searched through heaven and found a Savior Amen. to save a glorious soul like me. Woo! Glory to God. He stood out there in Masonic and he's go, Ho, ho, ho! Jesus saves! <laughs> the Bible saves from God's. And he's preaching, and, and the people that's ringing the bell, they be go, oh. <laughs> And he'd stand up, and, uh, and people walk up and they said, Wow, Santa Claus preaching. What? Then you enter the throne of glory. Yeah. Oh, the Father opens up his arms, and oh, there's a banner raised up in the sky yeah. with all the angels. You go to church. through Buddha. It's not through the commandments. It's only through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to stay still and I'm just going to study at home. Uh, uh, I watch, watch preaching on the TV. Uh, uh, you can turn the preacher off. You can yeah. turn me off. like his skin turning to gold or something. You don't know what's going on. He's about two more steps. Here's that crowd. Hi, how you doing? Hey, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve. Like that. Way down there at the edge of that street, there's the Lord of said glory. And down he comes off that throne. He always would come down for a sitter. <laughs> and he comes down there. Well done, now, good and faithful servant of the joy of our Lord. Now, old boy's heart going down there, it says, Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Then he laid down on that table and 
Dr. Grace got out the scalpel and he removed that old cold stony heart out of my friend. Oh, he threw it in the trash can and he put a brand new heart into my friend's chest. And when he, when he woke up, uh, he looked around and he said, oh my, everything has been changed. Everything looks different. Oh, I'm so happy now that I had uh, the heart operation. Hey, praise God, there's no other savior like our God.